This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Uncle Tom's Cabin by Harriet Beecher Stowe. Chapter Twenty Two. The Grass Withereth, the Flower Fadeth. Life passes with us all a day at a time. So it passed with our friend Tom till two years were gone. Though parted from all his soul held dear, and though often yearning for what lay beyond, still was he never positively and consciously miserable. For so well is the harp of human feeling strung, that nothing but a crash that breaks every string can wholly mar its harmony. And, on looking back to seasons which in review appear to us as those of deprivation and trial, we can remember that each hour, as it glided, brought its diversions and alleviations, so that, though not happy wholly, we were not either wholly miserable. Tom read, in his only literary cabinet, of one who had learned in whatsoever state he was therewith to be content. It seemed to him good and reasonable doctrine, and accorded well with the settled and thoughtful habit which he had acquired from the reading of that same book. His letter homeward, as we related in the last chapter, was in due time answered by Master George, in a good, round, schoolboy hand, that Tom said might be read most across the room. It contained various refreshing items of home intelligence, with which our reader is fully acquainted, stated how Aunt Chloe had been hired out to a confectioner in Louisville, where her skill in the pastry line was gaining wonderful sums of money, all of which, Tom was informed, was to be laid up to go to make up the sum of his redemption money. Mose and Pete were thriving, and the baby was trotting all about the house, under the care of Sally and the family generally. Tom's cabin was shut up for the present, but George expatiated brilliantly on ornaments and additions to be made to it when Tom came back. The rest of this letter gave a list of George's school studies, each one headed by a flourishing capital, and also told the names of four new colts that appeared on the premises since Tom left, and stated in the same connection that father and mother were well. The style of the letter was decidedly concise and terse, but Tom thought it the most wonderful specimen of composition that had appeared in modern times. He was never tired of looking at it, and even held a council with Eva on the expediency of getting it framed to hang up in his room. Nothing but the difficulty of arranging it so that both sides of the page would show at once stood in the way of this undertaking. The friendship between Tom and Eva had grown with the child's growth. It would be hard to say what place she held in the soft, impressible heart of her faithful attendant. He loved her as something frail and earthly, yet almost worshipped her as something heavenly and divine. He gazed on her as the Italian sailor gazes on his image of the child Jesus, with a mixture of reverence and tenderness, and to humor her graceful fancies, and meet those thousand simple wants which invest childhood like a many-colored rainbow, was Tom's chief delight. In the market, at morning, his eyes were always on the flower-stalls for rare bouquets for her, and the choicest peach or orange was slipped into his pocket to give to her when he came back and the sight that pleased him most was her sunny head looking out the gate for his distant approach, and her childish questions. "'Well, Uncle Tom, what have you got for me today? Nor was Eva less zealous in kind offices in return. Though a child, she was a beautiful reader, a fine musical ear, a quick poetic fancy, and an instinctive sympathy with what's grand and noble, made her such a reader of the Bible as Tom had never before heard. At first she read to please her humble friend, but soon her own earnest nature threw out its tendrils, and wound itself around the majestic book, and Eva loved it, because it woke in her strange yearnings and strong, dim emotions, such as impassioned imaginative children love to feel. The parts that pleased her most were the revelations and the prophecies, parts whose dim and wondrous imagery and fervent language impressed her the more that she questioned vainly of their meaning. And she and her simple friend, the old child and the young one, felt just alike about it. All that they knew was that they spoke of a glory to be revealed, a wondrous something yet to come, wherein their soul rejoiced, yet knew not why, and though it be not so in the physical, yet in moral science that which cannot be understood is not always profitless. 
for the soul awakes, a trembling stranger, between two dim eternities, the eternal past, the eternal future. The light shines only on a small space around her, therefore she needs must yearn toward the unknown, and the voices and shadowy movings which come to her from out the cloudy pillar of inspiration have each one echoes and answers in her own expecting nature. Its mystic imagery are so many talismans and gems inscribed with unknown hieroglyphics. She folds them in her bosom, and expects to read them when she passes beyond the veil. At this time in our story the whole St. Clair establishment is, for the time being, removed to their villa on Lake Pontchartrain. The heats of summer have driven all who are able to leave the sultry and unhealthy city to seek the shores of the lake and its cool sea-breezes. St. Clair's villa was an East Indian cottage, surrounded by light verandas of bamboo-work, and opening on all sides into gardens and pleasure-grounds. The common sitting-room opened on to a large garden, fragrant with every picturesque plant and flower of the tropics, where winding paths ran down to the very shores of the lake, whose silvery sheet of water lay there, rising and falling in the sunbeams, a picture never for an hour the same, yet every hour more beautiful. It is now one of those intensely golden sunsets which kindles the whole horizon into one blaze of glory, and makes the water another sky. The lake lay in rosy or golden streaks, save where white-winged vessels glided hither and thither, like so many spirits, and little golden stars twinkled through the glow, and looked down at themselves as they trembled in the water. Tom and Eva were seated on a little mossy seat in an arbor at the foot of the garden. It was Sunday evening, and Eva's Bible lay open on her knee. She read, "'And I saw a sea of glass mingled with fire.' Tom," said Eva, suddenly stopping and pointing to the lake, "there it is." "What, Miss Eva?" "Don't you see there?" said the child, pointing to the glassy water which, as it rose and fell, reflected the golden glow of the sky. "There is a sea of glass mingled with fire." "True enough, Miss Eva," said Tom, and Tom sang, "Oh, had I the wings of the morning, I'd fly away to Canaan's shore." bright angels should convey me home to the New Jerusalem." "'Where do you suppose New Jerusalem is, Uncle Tom?' said Eva. "'Oh, up in the clouds, Miss Eva.' "'Then I think I see it,' said Eva. "'Look in those clouds. They look like great gates of pearl. And you can see beyond them, far, far off, it's all gold. Tom, sing about spirits bright. Tom sung the words of a well-known Methodist hymn. "'I see a band of spirits bright, that taste the glories there. They all are robed in spotless white, and conquering palms they bear.' "'Uncle Tom, I've seen them,' said Eva. Tom had no doubt of it at all. It did not surprise him in the least. If Eva had told him she had been to heaven, he would have thought it entirely probable. "'They come to me sometimes in my sleep, those spirits and Eva's eyes grew dreamy, and she hummed in a low voice, "'They are all robed in spotless white, and conquering palms they bear.' "'Uncle Tom,' said Eva, "'I'm going there.' "'Where, Miss Eva?' The child rose, and pointed her little hand to the sky. The glow of evening lit her golden hair and flushed cheek with a kind of unearthly radiance, and her eyes were bent earnestly on the skies. "'I'm going there,' she said to the spirits bright, Tom. I'm going before long." The faithful old heart felt a sudden thrust, and Tom thought how often he had noticed, within six months, that Eva's little hands had grown thinner, and her skin more transparent, and her breath shorter, and how, when she ran or played in the garden, as she once could for hours, she became soon so tired and languid. He had heard Miss Ophelia speak often of a cough that all her medicaments could not cure, and even now that fervent cheek and little hand were burning with hectic fever. And yet the thought that Eva's words suggested had never come to him till now. Has there ever been a child like Eva? Yes, there have been. But their names are always on gravestones, and their sweet smiles, their heavenly eyes, their singular words and ways, are among the buried treasures of yearning hearts. 
in how many families do you hear the legend that all the goodness and graces of the living are nothing to the peculiar charms of one who is not it is as if heaven had an especial band of angels whose office it was to sojourn for a season here and endear to them the wayward human heart that they might bear it upward with them in their homeward flight when you see that deep spiritual light in the eye when the little soul reveals itself in words sweeter and wiser than the ordinary words of children, hope not to retain that child, for the seal of heaven is on it, and the light of immortality looks out from its eyes. Even so, beloved Eva, fair star of thy dwelling, thou art passing away, but they that love thee dearest know it not. The colloquy between Tom and Eva was interrupted by a hasty call from Miss Ophelia. "'Eva! Eva! Why, child, the dew is falling. You mustn't be out there!' Eva and Tom hastened in. Miss Ophelia was old and skilled in the tactics of nursing. She was from New England, and knew well the first guileless footsteps of that soft, insidious disease which sweeps away so many of the fairest and loveliest, and, before one fibre of life seems broken, seals them irrevocably for death. She had noted the slight dry cough, the daily brightening cheek, nor could the luster of the eye and the airy buoyancy born of fever deceive her. She tried to communicate her fears to St. Clair, but he threw back her suggestions with a restless petulance unlike his usual careless good humor. "'Don't be croaking, cousin. I hate it,' he would say. "'Don't you see that the child is only growing? Children always lose strength when they grow fast.' but she has that cough. Oh, nonsense of that cough! It is not anything. She has taken a little cold, perhaps. Well, that was just the way Eliza Jane was taken, and Ellen, and Maria Sanders. Oh, stop these hobgoblin nurse legends! You old hands got so wise that a child cannot cough or sneeze, but you see desperation and ruin at hand. Only take care of the child, keep her from the night air, and don't let her play too hard, and she'll do well enough. So St. Clair said, but he grew nervous and restless. He watched Eva feverishly day by day, as might be told by the frequency with which he repeated over that the child was quite well, that there wasn't anything in that cough, it was only some little stomach affection, such as children often had. But he kept by her more than before, took her oftener to ride with him, brought home every few days some receipt or strengthening mixture. Not, he said, that the child needed it, but then it would not do her any harm. If it must be told, the thing that struck a deeper pang to his heart than anything else was the daily increasing maturity of the child's mind and feelings. While still retaining all a child's fanciful graces, yet she often dropped, unconsciously, words of such a reach of thought and strange unworldly wisdom that they seemed to be an inspiration. At such times St. Clair would feel a sudden thrill, and clasp her in his arms, as if that fond clasp could save her, and his heart rose up with wild determination to keep her, never to let her go. The child's whole heart and soul seemed absorbed in works of love and kindness. Impulsively generous she had always been, but there was a touching and womanly thoughtfulness about her now that every one noticed. She still loved to play with Topsy and the various colored children but she now seemed rather a spectator than an actor of their plays, and she would sit for half an hour at a time, laughing at the odd tricks of Topsy, and then a shadow would seem to pass across her face, her eyes grew misty, and her thoughts were afar. Mamma, she said suddenly to her mother one day, "'why don't we teach our servants to read?' "'What a question, child! People never do!' "'Why don't they?' said Eva because it is no use for them to read. It don't help them to work any better, and they are not made for anything else. But they ought to read the Bible, Mamma, to learn God's will. Oh, they can get that read to them all they need. It seems to me, Mamma, the Bible is for every one to read themselves. They need it a great many times when there is nobody to read it. Eva, you are an odd child, said her mother. Miss Ophelia has taught Topsy to read," continued Eva. "'Yes, and you see how much good it does. Topsy is the worst creature I ever saw.' "'Here's poor Mammy,' said Eva. 
She does love the Bible so much, and wishes so she could read. And what will she do when I can't read to her?" Marie was busy, turning over the contents of a drawer as she answered. Well, of course, by and by, Eva, you will have other things to think of besides reading the Bible round to servants. Not but that is very proper. I've done it myself, when I had health. But when you come to be dressing and going into company, you won't have time. See here," she added, these jewels I am going to give you when you come out. I wore them to my first ball. I can tell you, Eva, I made a sensation. Eva took the jewel-case and lifted from it a diamond necklace. Her large, thoughtful eyes rested on them, but it was plain her thoughts were elsewhere. "'How sober you look, child,' said Marie. "'Are these worth a great deal of money, Mamma? "'To be sure they are. Father sent to France for them. They are worth a small fortune.' "'I wish I had them,' said Eva, "'to do what I pleased with.' "'What would you do with them?' "'I'd sell them, and buy a place in the Free States and take all our people there, and hire teachers, to teach them to read and write." Eva was cut short by her mother's laughing. "'Set up a boarding-school! Wouldn't you teach them to play on the piano and paint on velvet? I'd teach them to read their own Bible, and write their own letters, and read letters that are written to them,' said Eva steadily. "'I know, Mamma, it does come very hard on them that they can't do these things. Tom feels it. Mammy does. A great many of them do. I think it's wrong." "'Come, come, Eva, you are only a child. You don't know anything about these things,' said Marie. "'Besides, your talking makes my head ache.' Marie always had a headache on hand for any conversation that did not exactly suit her. Eva stole away, but after that she assiduously gave Mammy reading lessons. End of chapter 22 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Uncle Tom's Cabin by Harriet Beecher Stowe. Chapter 23 Henrik. About this time, St. Clair's brother Alfred, with his eldest son, a boy of twelve, spent a day or two with the family at the lake. No sight could be more singular and beautiful than that of these twin brothers. Nature, instead of instituting resemblances between them, had made them opposites on every point. Yet a mysterious tie seemed to unite them in a closer friendship than ordinary. They used to saunter, arm in arm, up and down the alleys and walks of the garden. Augustine, with his blue eyes and golden hair, his ethereally flexible form and vivacious features, and Alfred, dark-eyed, with haughty Roman profile, firmly knit limbs, and decided bearing. They were always abusing each other's opinions and practices, and yet never a whit the less absorbed in each other's society. In fact, the very contrariety seemed to unite them, like the attraction between opposite poles of the magnet. Henrik, the eldest son of Alfred, was a noble, dark-eyed, princely boy, full of vivacity and spirit, and from the first moment of introduction seemed to be perfectly fascinated by the spirituelle graces of his cousin Evangeline. Eva had a little pet pony, of a snowy whiteness. It was easy as a cradle, and as gentle as its little mistress. And this pony was now brought up to the back veranda by Tom, while a little mulatto boy of about thirteen led along a small black Arabian, which had just been imported at a great expense for Henrik. Henrik had a boy's pride in his new possession, and as he advanced and took the reins out of the hands of his little groom, he looked carefully over him and his brow darkened. "'What's this, Dodo, you little lazy dog? You haven't rubbed my horse down this morning.' "'Yes, massa,' said Dodo submissively. "'He got that dust on his own self.' "'You rascal, shut your mouth,' said Henrik, violently raising his riding-whip. "'How dare you speak?' The boy was a handsome, bright-eyed mulatto of just Henrik's size, and his curling hair hung round a high, bold forehead. He had white blood in his veins as could be seen by the quick flush in his cheek and the sparkle of his eye, as he eagerly tried to speak. "'Massa Henrik!' he began. Henrik struck him across the face with his riding-whip, and, seizing one of his arms, forced him on to his knees and beat him till he was out of breath. "'There, you impudent dog! Now will you learn not to answer back when I speak to you? Take the horse back, and clean him properly. I'll teach you your place.' "'Young Massa,' said Tom, 
I specs what he was gwine to say was that the horse would roll when he was bringing him up from the stable. He's so full of spirits, that's the way he got that dirt on him. I look to his cleaning. You hold your tongue till you're asked to speak, said Henrik, turning on his heel and walking up the steps to speak to Eva, who stood in her riding dress. Dear cousin, I'm sorry this stupid fellow has kept you waiting, he said. Let's sit down here on this seat till they come. What's the matter, cousin? You look sober. How could you be so cruel and wicked to poor Dodo? asked Eva. Cruel? Wicked? said the boy with unaffected surprise. What do you mean, dear Eva? I don't want you to call me dear Eva when you do so, said Eva. Dear cousin, you don't know Dodo. It's the only way to manage him. He's so full of lies and excuses. The only way is to put him down at once, not let him open his mouth. That's the way Papa manages. But Uncle Tom said it was an accident, and he never tells what isn't true. He's an uncommon old nigger, then, said Henrik. Dodo will lie as fast as he can speak. You frighten him into deceiving, if you treat him so. Why, Eva, you've really taken such a fancy to Dodo that I shall be jealous. But you beat him, and he didn't deserve it. Oh, well, it may go for some time when he does, and don't get it. A few cuts never come amiss with Dodo. He's a regular spirit, I can tell you. But I won't beat him again before you, if it troubles you." Eva was not satisfied, but found it in vain to try to make her handsome cousin understand her feelings. Dodo soon appeared with the horses. "'Well, Dodo, you've done pretty well this time,' said his young master, with a more gracious air. "'Come, now, and hold Miss Eva's horse while I put her on the saddle.' Dodo came and stood by Eva's pony. His face was troubled. His eyes looked as if he had been crying. Henrik, who valued himself on his gentlemanly adroitness in all matters of gallantry, soon had his fair cousin in the saddle, and, gathering the reins, placed them in her hands. But Eva bent to the other side of the horse, where Dodo was standing, and said as he relinquished the reins, "'That's a good boy, Dodo. Thank you.' Dodo looked up in amazement into the sweet young face. The blood rushed to his cheeks, and the tears to his eyes. "'Here, Dodo,' said his master imperiously. Dodo sprang and held the horse while his master mounted. "'There's a picayune for you to buy candy with, Dodo,' said Henrik. "'Go get some.' And Henrik cantered down the walk after Eva. Dodo stood looking after the two children. One had given him money, and one had given him what he wanted far more—a kind word, kindly spoken. Dodo had been only a few months away from his mother. His master had bought him at a slave warehouse for his handsome face to be a match to the handsome pony and he was now getting his breaking in at the hands of his young master. The scene of the beating had been witnessed by the two brothers, St. Clair, from another part of the garden. Augustine's cheek flushed, but he only observed, with his usual sarcastic carelessness, "'I suppose that's what we may call Republican education, Alfred?' "'Henrik is a devil of a fellow when his blood's up,' said Alfred carelessly. "'I suppose you consider this an instructive practice for him,' said Augustine dryly. I couldn't help it if I didn't. Henrik is a regular little tempest. His mother and I have given him up long ago. But then, that Dodo is a perfect sprite. No amount of whipping can hurt him. And this by way of teaching Henrik the first verse of a Republican's catechism, all men are born free and equal. Poe, said Alfred, one of Tom Jefferson's pieces of French sentiment and humbug. It's perfectly ridiculous to have that going the rounds among us to this day. I think it is," said St. Clair, significantly. "'Because,' said Alfred, "'we can see plainly enough that all men are not born free, nor born equal. They are born anything else. For my part, I think half this Republican talk sheer humbug. It is the educated, the intelligent, the wealthy, the refined who ought to have equal rights, and not the canaille. If you can keep the canaille of that opinion,' said St. Augustine, "'they took their turn once in France.' Well, of course they must be kept down, consistently, steadily, as I should," said Alfred, setting his foot hard down, as if he were standing on someone. "'It makes a terrible slip when they get up,' said Augustine. "'In St. Domingo, for instance.' "'Pooh!' said Alfred. "'We'll take care of that in this country. We must set our face against all this educating, elevating talk that is getting about now. The lower class must not be educated.' "'That is past praying for,' said Augustine. 
Educated they will be, and we have only to say how. Our system is educating them in barbarism and brutality. We are breaking all humanizing ties, and making them brute beasts, and if they get the upper hand, such we shall find them." "'They shall never get the upper hand,' said Alfred. "'That's right,' said St. Clair. "'Put on the steam, fasten down the escape valve, and sit on it, and see where you'll land.' "'Well,' said Alfred, "'we will see. I'm not afraid to sit on the escape valve, as long as the boilers are strong and the machinery works well. The nobles in Louis the Sixteenth's time thought just so, and Austria and Pius the Ninth think so now. And some pleasant morning you may all be caught up to meet each other in the air when the boilers burst." "'Diez de Cladabit,' said Alfred, laughing. "'I tell you,' said Augustine, "'if there is anything that is revealed with the strength of a divine law in our times, it is that the masses are to rise, and the underclass become the upper one. That's one of your red Republican humbugs, Augustine. Why didn't you ever take to the stump? You'd make a famous stump orator. Well, I hope I shall be dead before this millennium of your greasy masses comes on." "'Greasy or not greasy, they will govern you, when their time comes,' said Augustine, "'and they will be just such rulers as you make them. The French noblesse chose to have the people sans culotte, and they had sans culotte governors to their heart's content. The people of Haiti—oh, come, Augustine, as if we hadn't had enough of that abominable contemptible Haiti!" Note. In August 1791, as a consequence of the French Revolution, the black slaves and the mulattoes on Haiti rose in revolt against the whites, and in the period of turmoil that followed enormous cruelties were practiced by both sides. The Emperor de Salines, come to power in 1804, massacred all the whites on the island. Haitian bloodshed became an argument to show the barbarous nature of the negro, a doctrine Wendell Phillips sought to combat in his celebrated lecture on Toussaint l'Ouverture. The Haitians were not Anglo-Saxons. If they had been, there would have been another story. The Anglo-Saxon is the dominant race of the world, and is to be so. Well, there is a pretty fair infusion of Anglo-Saxon blood among our slaves now," said Augustine. There are plenty among them who have only enough of the African to give a sort of tropical warmth and fervor to our calculating firmness and foresight. If ever the San Domingo hour comes, Anglo-Saxon blood will lead on the day. Sons of white fathers, with all our haughty feelings burning in their veins, will not always be bought and sold and traded. They will rise, and raise with them their mother's race. Stuff! Nonsense! Well, said Augustine, there goes an old saying to this effect, As it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be. They ate, they drank, they planted, they builded, and knew not till the flood came and took them. On the whole, Augustine, I think your talents might do for a circuit-rider," said Alfred, laughing. "'Never you fear for us. Possession is our nine points. We've got the power. This subject-race,' said he, stamping firmly, "'is down and shall stay down. We have energy enough to manage our own powder. Sons trained like your Henrik will be grand guardians of your powder-magazines,' said Augustine. So cool and self-possessed, the proverb says, "'They that cannot govern themselves cannot govern others.' There is a trouble there," said Alfred thoughtfully. There is no doubt that our system is a difficult one to train children under. It gives too free scope to the passions altogether, which in our climate are hot enough. I find trouble with Henrik. The boy is generous and warm-hearted, but a perfect firecracker when excited. I believe I shall send him north for his education, where obedience is more fashionable, and where he will associate more with equals and less with dependents. Since training children is the staple work of the human race," said Augustine, I should think it's something of a consideration that our system does not work well there. It does not for some things," said Alfred. For others, again, it does. It makes boys manly and courageous, and the very vices of an abject race tend to strengthen in them the opposite virtues. I think Henrik, now, has a keener sense of the beauty of truth, from seeing lying and deception the universal badge of slavery. A Christian-like view of the subject, certainly," said Augustine. It's true, Christian-like or not, and is about as Christian-like as most other things in the world," said Alfred. That may be," said St. Clair. Well, there's no use in talking, Augustine. I believe we've been round and round this old track five hundred times, more or less. What do you say to a game of backgammon? 
The two brothers ran up the veranda steps, and were soon seated at a light bamboo stand with a backgammon board between them. As they were setting their men, Alfred said, "'I tell you, Augustine, if I thought as you do, I should do something.' "'I dare say you would. You are one of the doing sort. But what?' "'Why, elevate your servants for a specimen,' said Alfred, with a half-scornful smile. "'You might as well set Mount Etna on them flat, and tell them to stand up under it, as tell me to elevate my servants under all the superincumbent mass of society upon them. One man can do nothing against the whole action of a community. Education, to do anything, must be a state education, or there must be enough agreed in it to make a current.' "'You take the first throw,' said Alfred and the brothers were soon lost in the game, and heard no more till the scraping of horses' feet was heard under the veranda. "'There come the children,' said Augustine, rising. "'Look here, Alf. Did you ever see anything so beautiful?' And in truth it was a beautiful sight. Henrik, with his bold brow, and dark glossy curls, and glowing cheek, was laughing gaily as he bent towards his fair cousin as they came on. She was dressed in a blue riding-dress, with a cap of the same color. Exercise had given a brilliant hue to her cheeks, and heightened the effect of her singularly transparent skin and golden hair. "'Good heavens, what perfectly dazzling beauty!' said Alfred. "'I tell you, August, won't she make some hearts ache one of these days?' "'She will, too truly. God knows I'm afraid so,' said St. Clair, in a tone of sudden bitterness, as he hurried down to take her off her horse. "'Eva, darling, you're not much tired?' he said, as he clasped her in his arms. "'No, papa!' said the child, but her short, hard breathing alarmed her father. "'How could you ride so fast, dear? You know it's bad for you.' "'I felt so well, papa. I liked it so much I forgot.' St. Clair carried her in his arms into the parlour and laid her on the sofa. "'Henrik, you must be careful of Eva,' said he. "'You mustn't ride fast with her.' "'I'll take her under my care,' said Henrik, seating himself by the sofa and taking Eva's hand. Eva soon found herself much better. Her father and uncle resumed their game, and the children were left together. "'Do you know, Eva, I'm sorry Papa is only going to stay two days here, and then I shan't see you again for ever so long. If I stay with you, I try to be good, and not be cross to Dodo, and so on. I don't mean to treat Dodo ill, but, you know, I've got such a quick temper. I'm not really bad to him, though. I give him a picayune now and then, and you see he dresses well. I think, on the whole, Dodo's pretty well off.' Would you think you were well off, if there were not one creature in the world near you to love you?" "'I? Well, of course not. And you have taken Dodo away from all the friends he ever had, and now he has not a creature to love him. Nobody can be good that way." "'Well, I can't help it, as I know of. I can't get his mother, and I can't love him myself, nor anybody else as I know of." "'Why can't you?' said Eva. "'Love, Dodo? Why, Eva, you wouldn't have me. I may like him well enough, but you don't love your servants." "'I do, indeed. How odd! Don't the Bible say we must love everybody?' "'Oh, the Bible! To be sure, it says a great many such things, but then nobody ever thinks of doing them, you know, Eva. Nobody does.' Eva did not speak. Her eyes were fixed and thoughtful for a few moments. "'At any rate,' she said, Dear cousin, do love poor Dodo, and be kind to him, for my sake. I could love anything for your sake, dear cousin, for I really think you are the loveliest creature that I ever saw." And Henrik spoke with an earnestness that flushed his handsome face. Eva received it with perfect simplicity, without even a change of feature, merely saying, "'I'm glad you feel so, dear Henrik. I hope you will remember.' The dinner-bell put an end to the interview. End of chapter 23「This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. " Uncle Tom's Cabin by Harriet Beecher Stowe Chapter twenty four Foreshadowings Two days after this, Alfred St. Clair and Augustine parted, and Eva, who had been stimulated by the society of her young cousin to exertions beyond her strength, began to fail rapidly. St. Clair was at last willing to call in medical advice, a thing from which he had always shrunk, because it was the admission of an unwelcome truth. But, 
For a day or two Eva was so unwell as to be confined to the house, and the doctor was called. Marie St. Clair had taken no notice of the child's gradually decaying health and strength, because she was completely absorbed in studying out two or three new forms of disease to which she believed she herself was a victim. It was the first principle of Marie's belief that nobody ever was or could be so great a sufferer as herself, and therefore she always repelled quite indignantly any suggestion that any one around her could be sick. She was always sure, in such a case, that it was nothing but laziness, or want of energy, and that if they had had the suffering she had, they would soon know the difference. Miss Ophelia had several times tried to awaken her maternal fears about Eva, but to no avail. "'I don't see as anything ails the child,' she would say. "'She runs about and plays.' "'But she has a cough.' "'Cough? You don't need to tell me about a cough. I've always been subject to a cough all my days. When I was Eva's age, they thought I was in a consumption. Night after night, Mammy used to sit up with me. Oh, Eva's cough is not anything. But she gets weak, and is short-breathed. Law, I've had that years and years. It's only a nervous affection. But she sweats so nights. Well, I have these ten years. Very often, night after night, my clothes will be wringing wet. There won't be a dry thread in my night-clothes, and the sheets will be so that Mammy has to hang them up to dry. Eva doesn't sweat anything like that." Miss Ophelia shut her mouth for a season, but now that Eva was fairly and visibly prostrated and a doctor called, Marie, all on a sudden, took a new turn. "'She knew it,' she said. She always felt it, that she was destined to be the most miserable of mothers. Here she was, with her wretched health and her only darling child going down to the grave before her eyes and Marie routed up Mammy's nights, and rumpused and scolded, with more energy than ever, all day, on the strength of this new misery. "'My dear Marie, don't talk so,' said St. Clair. "'You ought not to give up the case so, at once.' "'You have not a mother's feeling, St. Clair. You never could understand me. You don't know. But don't talk so, as if it were a gone case. I can't take it as indifferently as you can, St. Clair. If you don't feel when your only child is in this alarming state, I do. It's a blow too much for me, with all I was bearing before." "'It's true,' said St. Clair, "'that Eva is very delicate, that I always knew, and that she has grown so rapidly as to exhaust her strength, and that her situation is critical. But just now she is only prostrated by the heat of the weather, and by the excitement of her cousin's visit, and the exertions she made. The physician says there is room for hope. Well, of course, if you can look on the bright side, pray do. It's a mercy if people haven't sensitive feelings in this world. I am sure I wish I didn't feel as I do. It only makes me completely wretched. I wish I could be as easy as the rest of you." And the rest of them had good reason to breathe the same prayer, for Marie paraded her new misery as the reason and apology for all sorts of inflictions on every one about her. Every word that was spoken by anybody, everything that was done or was not done everywhere, was only a new proof that she was surrounded by hard-hearted, insensible beings who were unmindful of her peculiar sorrows. Poor Eva heard some of these speeches, and nearly cried her little eyes out in pity for her mamma, and in sorrow that she should make her so much distress. In a week or two there was a great improvement of symptoms one of those deceitful lulls, by which her inexorable disease so often beguiles the anxious heart, even on the verge of the grave. Eva's step was again in the garden, in the balconies. She played and laughed again, and her father, in a transport, declared that they should soon have her as hearty as anybody. Miss Ophelia, and the physician alone, felt no encouragement from this elusive truce. There was one other heart, too, that felt the same certainty, and that was the little heart of Eva. What is it that sometimes speaks in the soul so calmly, so clearly, that its earthly time is short? Is it the secret instinct of decaying nature, or the soul's impulsive throb, as immortality draws on? Be it what it may, it rested in the heart of Eva, a calm, sweet, prophetic certainty that heaven was near, calm as the light of sunset, sweet as the bright stillness of autumn. There her little heart reposed only troubled by sorrow for those who loved her so dearly. 
for the child, though nursed so tenderly, and though life was unfolding before her with every brightness that love and wealth could give, had no regret for herself in dying. In that book which she and her simple old friend had read so much together, she had seen and taken to her young heart the image of one who loved the little child, and as she gazed and mused, he had ceased to be an image and a picture of the distant past, and come to be a living, all-surrounding reality. His love enfolded her childish heart with more than mortal tenderness, and it was to him, she said, she was going, and to his home. But her heart yearned with sad tenderness for all that she was to leave behind. Her father most, for Eva, though she never distinctly thought so, had an instinctive perception that she was more in his heart than any other. She loved her mother because she was so loving a creature, and all the selfishness that she had seen in her only saddened and perplexed her, for she had a child's implicit trust that her mother could not do wrong. There was something about her that Eva never could make out, and she always smoothed it over with thinking that, after all, it was Mama, and she loved her very dearly indeed. She felt, too, for those fond, faithful servants to whom she was as daylight and sunshine. Children do not usually generalize, but Eva was an uncommonly mature child, and the things that she had witnessed of the evils of the system under which they were living had fallen, one by one, into the depths of her thoughtful, pondering heart. She had vague longings to do something for them, to bless and save not only them, but all in their condition, longings that contrasted sadly with the feebleness of her little frame. "'Uncle Tom,' she said one day, when she was reading to her friend, "'I can understand why Jesus wanted to die for us.' "'Why, Miss Eva?' "'Because I felt so, too.' "'What is it, Miss Eva? I don't understand.' "'I can't tell you. But when I saw those poor creatures on the boat, you know, when you came up and I—' Some had lost their mothers, and some their husbands, and some mothers cried for their little children. And when I heard about your poor Prue, oh, wasn't that dreadful! And a great many other times, I felt that I would be glad to die, if my dying could stop all this misery. I would die for them, Tom, if I could," said the child earnestly, laying her little thin hand on his. Tom looked at the child with awe and when she, hearing her father's voice, glided away, he wiped his eyes many times as he looked after her. "'It's just no use trying to keep Miss Eva here,' he said to Mammy, whom he met a moment after. "'She's got the Lord's mark in her forehead.' "'Ah, yes, yes,' said Mammy, raising her hands. "'I've allers said so. She wasn't never like a child that's to live. There was allers something deep in her eyes.' I've told Missus so many the time. It's a comin' true. We all sees it, dear little blessed lamb." Eva came tripping up the veranda steps to her father. It was late in the afternoon, and the rays of the sun formed a kind of glory behind her as she came forward in her white dress, with her golden hair and glowing cheeks, her eyes unnaturally bright with the slow fever that burned in her veins. St. Clair had called her to show a statuette that he had been buying for her. But her appearance, as she came on, impressed him suddenly and painfully. There is a kind of beauty so intense, yet so fragile, that we cannot bear to look at it. Her father folded her suddenly in his arms, and almost forgot what he was going to tell her. "'Eva, dear, you are better nowadays, are you not?' "'Papa,' said Eva, with sudden firmness, "'I've had things I wanted to say to you a great while. I want to say them now, before I get weaker." St. Clair trembled as Eva seated herself in his lap. She laid her head on his bosom and said, "'It's all no use, Papa, to keep it to myself any longer. The time is coming that I am going to leave you. I am going, and never to come back.' And Eva sobbed. "'Oh, now, my dear little Eva,' said St. Clair, trembling as he spoke, but speaking cheerfully, "'you've got nervous and low-spirited. You mustn't indulge such gloomy thoughts. See here, I've bought a statuette for you.' "'No, Papa,' said Eva, putting it gently away. "'Don't deceive yourself. I am not any better. I know it perfectly well. 
and I am going, before long. I am not nervous. I am not low-spirited. If it were not for you, Papa, and my friends, I should be perfectly happy. I want to go. I long to go." "'Why, dear child, what has made your poor little heart so sad? You have had everything to make you happy that could be given to you. I had rather be in heaven, though only for my friends' sake I would be willing to live. There are a great many things here that make me sad, that seem dreadful to me. I had rather be there, but I don't want to leave you. It almost breaks my heart." "'What makes you sad and seems dreadful, Eva?' "'Oh, things that are done and done all the time. I feel sad for our poor people. They love me dearly, and they are all good and kind to me. I wish, Papa, they were all free." "'Why, Eva, child, don't you think they are well enough off now?' Oh, but, Papa, if anything should happen to you, what would become of them? There are very few men like you, Papa. Uncle Alfred isn't like you, and Mamma isn't. And then, think of poor old Prue's owners. What horrid things people do, and can do!" And Eva shuddered. "'My dear child, you are too sensitive. I'm sorry I ever let you hear such stories." "'Oh, that's what troubles me, Papa. You want me to live so happy, and never to have any pain, never suffer anything, not even hear a sad story, when other poor creatures have nothing but pain and sorrow in their lives. And it seems selfish. I ought to know such things. I ought to feel about them. Such things always sunk into my heart. They went down deep. I've thought and thought about them, Papa. Isn't there any way to have all slaves made free?" That's. A difficult question, dearest. There's no doubt that this way is a very bad one. A great many people think so. I do myself. I heartily wish that there were not a slave in the land. But then I don't know what is to be done about it." "'Papa, you are such a good man, and so noble and kind, and you always have a way of saying things that is so pleasant. Couldn't you go all around and try to persuade people to do right about this? When I am dead, Papa, then you will think of me, and do it for my sake. I would do it if I could." "'When you are dead, Eva,' said St. Clair passionately, "'oh, child, don't talk to me so. You are all I have on earth. Poor old Prue's child was all that she had, and yet she had to hear it crying, and she couldn't help it. Papa, these poor creatures love their children as much as you do me. Oh, do something for them. There's poor Mammy loves her children. I've seen her cry when she talked about them. And Tom loves his children. And it's dreadful, Papa, that such things are happening all the time." "'There, there, darling,' said St. Clair soothingly. Only don't distress yourself. Don't talk of dying. And I will do anything you wish. And promise me, dear father, that Tom shall have his freedom as soon as—' She stopped, and said in a hesitating tone, "'I am gone.' "'Yes, dear, I will do anything in the world, anything you ask me to.' "'Dear Papa,' said the child, laying her burning cheek against his, "'how I wish we could go together.' "'Where, dearest?' said St. Clair. "'To our Saviour's home. It's so sweet and peaceful there. It is all so loving there," the child spoke unconsciously, as of a place where she had often been. "'Don't you want to go, Papa?' she said. St. Clair drew her closer to him, but was silent. "'You will come to me,' said the child, speaking in a voice of calm certainty, which she often used unconsciously. "'I shall come after you. I shall not forget you.' The shadows of the solemn evening closed round them deeper and deeper, as St. Clair sat silently holding the little frail form to his bosom. He saw no more the deep eyes, but the voice came over him as a spirit voice, and, as in a sort of judgment vision, his whole past life rose in a moment before his eyes. His mother's prayers and hymns, his own early yearnings and aspirings for good, and between them and this hour, years of worldliness and skepticism, and what man calls respectable living. We can think much, 
very much in a moment. St. Clair saw and felt many things, but spoke nothing, and, as it grew darker, he took his child to her bedroom, and, when she was prepared for rest, he sent away the attendants, and rocked her in his arms, and sung to her till she was asleep. End of chapter 24「This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Uncle Tom's Cabin by Harriet Beecher Stowe Chapter 25 The Little Evangelist It was Sunday afternoon. St. Clair was stretched on a bamboo lounge in the veranda, solacing himself with a cigar. Marie lay reclined on a sofa opposite the window opening on the veranda closely secluded, under an awning of transparent gauze, from the outrages of the mosquitoes, and languidly holding in her hand an elegantly bound prayer-book. She was holding it because it was Sunday, and she imagined she had been reading it, though in fact she had been only taking a succession of short naps with it open in her hand. Miss Ophelia, who, after some rummaging, had hunted up a small Methodist meeting within riding distance, had gone out, with Tom as driver, to attend it and Eva had accompanied them. "'I say, Augustine,' said Marie, after dozing a while, "'I must send to the city after my old Dr. Posey. I'm sure I've got the complaint of the heart.' "'Well, why need you send for him? This doctor that attends Eva seems skillful.' "'I would not trust him in a critical case,' said Marie, "'and I think I may say mine is becoming so. I've been thinking of it these two or three nights past.' I have such distressing pains, and such strange feelings. Oh, Marie, you are blue. I don't believe it's heart complaint." "'I dare say you don't,' said Marie. I was prepared to expect that. You can be alarmed enough if Eva coughs, or has the least thing the matter with her, but you never think of me." "'If it's particularly agreeable to you to have heart disease, why, I'll try and maintain you have it,' said St. Clair. I didn't know it was." Well. I only hope you won't be sorry for this when it's too late," said Marie. But, believe it or not, my distress about Eva and the exertions I have made with that dear child have developed what I have long suspected. What the exertions were which Marie referred to, it would have been difficult to state. St. Clair quietly made this commentary to himself, and went on smoking, like a hard-hearted wretch of a man as he was, till a carriage drove up before the veranda, and Eva and Miss Ophelia alighted. Miss Ophelia marched straight to her own chamber to put away her bonnet and shawl, as was always her manner, before she spoke a word on any subject, while Eva came, at St. Clair's call, and was sitting on his knee, giving him an account of the services they had heard. They soon heard loud exclamations from Miss Ophelia's room, which, like the one in which they were sitting, opened on to the veranda, and violent reproof addressed to somebody. "'What new witchcraft has Tops been brewing?' asked St. Clair. That commotion is of her raising, I'll be bound." And in a moment after, Miss Ophelia, in high indignation, came dragging the culprit down. "'Come out here now,' she said. "'I will tell your master.' "'What's the case now?' asked Augustine. "'The case is that I cannot be plagued with this child any longer. It's past all bearing. Flesh and blood cannot endure it. Here I locked her up, and gave her a hymn to study. And what does she do but spy out where I put my key? and has gone to my bureau, and got a bonnet trimming, and cut it all to pieces to make dolls' jackets. I never saw anything like it in my life." "'I told you, cousin,' said Marie, "'that you'd find out that these creatures can't be brought up without severity. If I had my way now,' she said, looking reproachfully at St. Clair, "'I'd send that child out and have her thoroughly whipped. I'd have her whipped till she couldn't stand.' "'I don't doubt it,' said St. Clair. "'Tell me of the lovely rule of woman. I never saw above a dozen women that wouldn't half kill a horse, or a servant either, if they had their own way with them, let alone a man." "'There is no use in this shilly-shally way of yours, St. Clair,' said Marie. "'Cousin is a woman of sense, and she sees it now as plain as I do.' Miss Ophelia had just the capability of indignation that belongs to the thorough-paced housekeeper, and this had been pretty actively roused by the artifice and wastefulness of the child. In fact, Many of my lady readers must own that they should have felt just so in her circumstances. 
but Marie's words went beyond her, and she felt less heat. "'I wouldn't have the child treated so for the world,' she said. "'But I am sure, Augustine, I don't know what to do. I've taught and taught. I've talked till I'm tired. I've whipped her. I've punished her in every way I can think of, and she's just what she was at first. "'Come here, Tops, you monkey,' said St. Clair, calling the child up to him. Topsy came up, her round, hard eyes glittering and blinking, with a mixture of apprehensiveness and their usual odd drollery. "'What makes you behave so?' said St. Clair, who could not help being amused with the child's expression. "'Specs it's my wicked heart,' said Topsy, demurely. "'Miss Feely says so.' "'Don't you see how much Miss Ophelia has done for you? She says she has done everything she can think of.' "'Lo, yes, massa. Old Missus used to say so, too. She whipped me a heap harder, and used to pull my hair, and, and knock my head agin the door. But it didn't do me no good. I specs if they's to pull every spire of hair out of my head, it wouldn't do no good neither. I's so wicked laws. I's nothing but a nigger no ways. Well, I shall have to give her up," said Miss Ophelia. I can't have that trouble any longer. Well, I'd just like to ask you one question," said St. Clair. What is it? Why, if your gospel is not strong enough to save one heathen child, that you can have at home here all to yourself, what's the use of sending one or two poor missionaries off with it, among thousands of just such? I suppose this child is about a fair sample of what thousands of your heathen are." Miss Ophelia did not make an immediate answer, and Eva, who had stood a silent spectator of the scene thus far, made a silent sign to Topsy to follow her. There was a little glass room at the corner of the veranda which St. Clair used as a sort of reading-room, and Eva and Topsy disappeared into this place. "'What's Eva going about now?' said St. Clair. "'I mean to see.' And, advancing on tiptoe, he lifted up a curtain that covered the glass door, and looked in. In a moment, laying his finger on his lips, he made a silent gesture to Miss Ophelia to come and look. There sat the two children on the floor, with their side faces towards them. Topsy, with her usual air of careless drollery and unconcern, but opposite to her, Eva, her whole face fervent with feeling, and tears in her large eyes. "'What does make you so bad, Topsy? Why won't you try and be good? Don't you love anybody, Topsy?' "'Don't know nothing about love. I loves candy and sich, that's all,' said Topsy. "'But you love your father and mother. Never had none, you know. I told you that, Miss Eva.' "'Oh, I know,' said Eva sadly. "'But hadn't you any brother, or sister, or aunt, or—' "'No, none on em. Never had nothing, nor nobody.' "'But, Topsy, if you'd only try to be good, you might—' "'Couldn't never be nothing but a nigger, if I was ever so good,' said Topsy. "'If I could be skinned and come white, I'd try then.' "'But people can love you if you are black, Topsy. Miss Ophelia would love you if you were good.' Topsy gave the short, blunt laugh that was her common mode of expressing incredulity. "'Don't you think so?' said Eva. "'No. She can't bar me, cause I'm a nigger. She's soon have a toad touch her. There can't nobody love niggers, and niggers can't do nothing. I don't care,' said Topsy, beginning to whistle. "'Oh, Topsy, poor child, I love you,' said Eva, with a sudden burst of feeling, and laying her little thin white hand on Topsy's shoulder. "'I love you.' because you haven't had any father, or mother, or friends, because you've been a poor, abused child. I love you, and I, I want you to be good. I am very unwell, Topsy, and I think I shan't live a great while, and it really grieves me to have you be so naughty. I wish you would try to be good, for my sake. It's only a little while I shall be with you." The round, keen eyes of the black child were overcast with tears. Large, bright drops rolled heavily down, one by one, and fell on the little white hand. Yes, in that moment a ray of real belief, a ray of heavenly love, had penetrated the darkness of her heathen soul. She laid her head down between her knees, and wept and sobbed, while the beautiful child bending over her looked like the picture of some bright angel stooping to reclaim a sinner. "'Poor Topsy,' said Eva. Don't you know that Jesus loves all alike? He is just as willing to love you as me. He loves you just as I do, only more, because He is better. He will help you to be good, and you can go to heaven at last, and be an angel forever, just as much as if you were white. Only think of it, Topsy. 
you can be one of those spirits bright Uncle Tom sings about. Oh, dear Miss Eva, dear Miss Eva, said the child, I will try, I will try, I never did care nothing about it before. St. Clair at this instant dropped the curtain. It puts me in mind of mother, he said to Miss Ophelia. It is true what she told me. If we want to give sight to the blind, we must be willing to do as Christ did. Call them to us and put our hands on them. I've always had a prejudice against negroes, said Miss Ophelia, and it's a fact. I never could bear to have that child touch me. But I don't think she knew it. Trust any child to find that out, said St. Clair. There's no keeping it from them. But I believe that all the trying in the world to benefit a child, and all the substantial favors you can do for them, will never excite one emotion of gratitude, while that feeling of repugnance remains in the heart. It's a queer kind of a fact, but so it is. I don't know how I can help it, said Miss Ophelia. They are disagreeable to me. This child in particular, how can I help feeling so? Eva does, it seems. Well, she's so loving. After all, though, she's no more than Christ-like, said Miss Ophelia. I wish I were like her. She might teach me a lesson. It wouldn't be the first time a little child had been used to instruct an old disciple, if it were so, said St. Clair. End of chapter 25 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Uncle Tom's Cabin by Harriet Beecher Stowe Chapter 26 Death Weep not for those whom the veil of the tomb, in life's early morning, hath hid from our eyes. From Weep Not for Those, a poem by Thomas Moore, 1779-1852. Eva's bedroom was a spacious apartment, which, like all the other robins in the house, opened on to the broad veranda. The room communicated on one side with her father and mother's apartment, on the other with that appropriated to Miss Ophelia. St. Clair had gratified his own eye and taste in furnishing this room in a style that had a peculiar keeping with the character of her for whom it was intended. The windows were hung with curtains of rose-colored and white muslin. The floor was spread with a matting, which had been ordered in Paris, to a pattern of his own device, having round it a border of rosebuds and leaves, and a centerpiece with full-flown roses. The bedstead, chairs, and lounges were of bamboo, wrought in peculiarly graceful and fanciful patterns. Over the head of the bed was an alabaster bracket, on which a beautiful sculptured angel stood, with drooping wings, holding out a crown of myrtle leaves. From this depended, over the bed, light curtains of rose-colored gauze, striped with silver, supplying that protection from mosquitoes, which is an indispensable addition to all sleeping accommodation in that climate. The graceful bamboo lounges were amply supplied with cushions of rose-colored damask, while over them, depending from the hands of sculptured figures, were gauze curtains similar to those of the bed. A light fanciful bamboo table stood in the middle of the room, where a Parian vase, wrought in the shape of a white lily, with its buds stood, ever filled with flowers. On this table lay Eva's books, and little trinkets, with an elegantly wrought alabaster writing-stand which her father had supplied to her when he saw her trying to improve herself in writing. There was a fireplace in the room, and on the marble mantel above stood a beautifully wrought statuette of Jesus receiving little children, and on either side marble vases, for which it was Tom's pride and delight to offer bouquets every morning. Two or three exquisite paintings of children in various attitudes embellished the wall. In short, the eye could turn nowhere without meeting images of childhood, of beauty, and of peace. Those little eyes never opened in the morning light, without falling on something which suggested to the heart soothing and beautiful thoughts. The deceitful strength which had buoyed Eva up for a little while was fast passing away. Seldom, and more seldom, her light footstep was heard in the veranda, and oftener and oftener she was found reclined on a little lounge by the open window her large, deep eyes fixed on the rising and falling waters of the lake. It was towards the middle of the afternoon, as she was so reclining, her Bible half open, her little transparent fingers lying listlessly between the leaves. Suddenly she heard her mother's voice, in sharp tones, in the veranda. 
"'What now, you baggage? What new piece of mischief? You've been picking the flowers, hey?' And Eva heard the sound of a smart slap. "'Law, missus, they's for Miss Eva,' she heard a voice say, which she knew belonged to Topsy. "'Miss Eva? A pretty excuse. You suppose she wants your flowers? You good-for-nothing nigger! Get along off with you!' In a moment Eva was off from her lounge and in the veranda. "'Oh, don't, mother! I should like the flowers. Do give them to me. I want them.' "'Why, Eva, your room is full now.' "'I can't have too many,' said Eva. "'Topsy, do bring them here.' Topsy, who had stood sullenly, holding down her head, now came up and offered her flowers. She did it with a look of hesitation and bashfulness, quite unlike the eldritch boldness and brightness which was usual with her. "'It's a beautiful bouquet,' said Eva, looking at it. It was rather a singular one, a brilliant scarlet geranium, and one single white japonica, with its glossy leaves. It was tied up with an evident eye to the contrast of color, and the arrangement of every leaf had carefully been studied. Topsy looked pleased, as Eva said, "'Topsy, you arrange flowers very prettily.' "'Here,' she said, "'is this vase I haven't any flowers for. I wish you'd arrange something every day for it.' "'Well, that's odd,' said Marie. "'What in the world do you want that for?' "'Never mind, Mama. You'd as lief as not Topsy should do it, had you not?' "'Of course, anything you please, dear. Topsy, you hear your young mistress? See that you mind.' Topsy made a short curtsy and looked down, and as she turned away Eva saw a tear roll down her dark cheek. "'You see, Mama, I knew poor Topsy wanted to do something for me,' said Eva to her mother. "'Oh, nonsense! It's only because she likes to do mischief. She knows she mustn't pick flowers, so she does it. That's all there is to it. But if you fancy to have her pluck them, so be it.' "'Mama, I think Topsy is different from what she used to be. She's trying to be a good girl.' <laughs> "'She'll have to try a good while before she gets to be good,' said Marie, with a careless laugh. "'Well, you know, Mama, poor Topsy, everything has always been against her.' "'Not since she's been here, I'm sure. If she hasn't been talked to and preached to and every earthly thing done that anybody could do, and she's just so ugly and always will be, you can't make anything of the creature.' "'But, Mama, it's so different to be brought up as I've been, with so many friends, so many things to make me good and happy, and to be brought up as she's been all the time till she came here.' "'Most likely,' said Marie, yawning. "'Dear me, how hot it is! Mama, you believe, don't you, that Topsy could become an angel as well as any of us, if she were a Christian?' "'Topsy? What a ridiculous idea! Nobody but you would ever think of it. I suppose she could, though.' But, Mama, isn't God her father as much as ours? Isn't Jesus her savior? Well, that may be. I suppose God made everybody, said Marie. Where is my smelling bottle? It's such a pity. Oh, such a pity, said Eva, looking out on the distant lake and speaking half to herself. What's a pity? said Marie. Why, that any one who could be a bright angel and live with angels should go all down, 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 and nobody help them oh dear well we can't help them it's no use worrying eva i don't know what's to be done we ought to be thankful for our own advantages i hardly can be said eva i'm so sorry to think of poor folks that haven't any that's odd enough said marie i'm sure my religion makes me thankful for my advantages mamma said eva i want to have some of my hair cut off a good deal of it what for said marie Mamma, I want to give some away to my friends while I am able to give it to them myself. Won't you ask Auntie to come and cut it for me?" Marie raised her voice and called Miss Ophelia from the other room. The child half rose from her pillow as she came in, and, shaking down her long golden-brown curls, said rather playfully, "'Come, Auntie, shear the sheep.' "'What's that?' said St. Clair, who just then entered with some fruit he had been out to get for her. "'Papa, I just want Auntie to cut off some of my hair. There's too much of it, and it makes my head hot. Besides, I want to give some of it away." Miss Ophelia came with her scissors. "'Take care. Don't spoil the looks of it,' said her father. "'Cut underneath, where it won't show. Eva's curls are my pride.' "'Oh, Papa,' said Eva sadly. "'Yes, and I want them kept handsome against the time I take you up to your uncle's plantation to see Cousin Henrik,' said St. Clair in a gay tone. 
I shall never go there, Papa. I am going to a better country. Oh, do believe me. Don't you see, Papa, that I get weaker every day?" "'Why do you insist that I shall believe such a cruel thing, Eva?' said her father. "'Only because it is true, Papa. And if you will believe it now, perhaps you will get to feel about it as I do.' St. Clair closed his lips and stood gloomily eyeing the long, beautiful curls, which, as they were separated from the child's head, were laid one by one in her lap. She raised them up, looked earnestly at them, twined them round her thin fingers, and looked from time to time anxiously at her father. "'It's just what I've been foreboding,' said Marie. "'It's just what has been preying on my health from day to day, bringing me downward to the grave, though nobody regards it. I have seen this long. St. Clair, you will see after a while that I was right.' "'Which will afford you great consolation, no doubt,' said St. Clair, in a dry, bitter tone. Marie lay back on a lounge and covered her face with her cambric handkerchief. Eva's clear blue eye looked earnestly from one to the other. It was the calm, comprehending gaze of a soul half loosed from its earthly bonds. It was evident she saw, felt, and appreciated the difference between the two. She beckoned with her hand to her father. He came and sat down by her. "'Papa, my strength fades away every day, and I know I must go. There are some things I want to say and do that I ought to do and you are so unwilling to have me speak a word on this subject, but it must come. There's no putting it off. Do be willing I should speak now." "'My child, I am willing,' said St. Clair, covering his eyes with one hand, and holding up Eva's hand with the other. "'Then I want to see all our people together. I have some things I must say to them,' said Eva. "'Well,' said St. Clair, in a tone of dry endurance, Miss Ophelia dispatched a messenger, and soon the whole of the servants were convened in the room. Eva lay back on her pillows, her hair hanging loosely about her face, her crimson cheeks contrasting painfully with the intense whiteness of her complexion, and the thin contour of her limbs and features, and her large, soul-like eyes fixed earnestly on every one. The servants were struck with a sudden emotion. The spiritual face, the long locks of hair cut off and lying by her, her father's averted face, and Marie's sobs, struck at once upon the feelings of a sensitive and impressible race, and, as they came in, they looked one on another, sighed, and shook their heads. There was a deep silence, like that of a funeral. Eva raised herself, and looked long and earnestly round at every one. All looked sad and apprehensive. Many of the women hid their faces in their aprons. I sent for you all, my dear friends," said Eva, because I love you. I love you all, and I have something to say to you, which I want you always to remember. I am going to leave you. In a few more weeks you will see me no more." Here the child was interrupted by bursts of groans, sobs, and lamentations, which broke from all present, and in which her slender voice was lost entirely. She waited a moment, and then, Speaking in a tone that checked the sobs of all, she said, "'If you love me, you must not interrupt me so. Listen to what I say. I want to speak to you about your souls. Many of you, I am afraid, are very careless. You are thinking only about this world. I want you to remember that there is a beautiful world where Jesus is. I am going there, and you can go there. It is for you as much as for me.' But if you want to go there, you must not live idle, careless, thoughtless lives. You must be Christians. You must remember that each one of you can become angels, and be angels for ever. If you want to be Christians, Jesus will help you. You must pray to Him. You must read." The child checked herself, looked piteously at them, and said sorrowfully, "'Oh, dear, you can't read, poor souls!' And she hid her face in the pillow and sobbed while many a smothered sob from those she was addressing, who were kneeling on the floor, aroused her. "'Never mind,' she said, raising her face and smiling brightly through her tears. "'I have prayed for you, and I know Jesus will help you, even if you can't read. Try all to do the best you can. Pray every day. Ask Him to help you, and get the Bible read to you whenever you can, and I think I shall see you in heaven.' Amen, was the murmured response from the lips of Tom and Mammy, and some of the elder ones who belonged to the Methodist Church. 
the younger and more thoughtless ones, for the time completely overcome, were sobbing, with their heads bowed upon their knees. "'I know,' said Eva, "'you all love me.' "'Yes, oh, yes, indeed we do. Lord bless her!' was the involuntary answer of all. "'Yes, I know you do. There isn't one of you that hasn't always been very kind to me. And I want to give you something that, when you look at, you shall always remember me. I'm going to give all of you a curl of my hair. And, when you look at it, think that I loved you, and am gone to heaven, and that I want to see you all there." It is impossible to describe the scene as, with tears and sobs, they gathered round the little creature, and took from her hands what seemed to them a last mark of her love. They fell on their knees, they sobbed, and prayed, and kissed the hem of her garment, and the elder ones poured forth words of endearment, mingled in prayers and blessings, after the manner of their susceptible race. As each one took their gift, Miss Ophelia, who was apprehensive for the effect of all this excitement on her little patient, signed to each one to pass out of the apartment. At last all were gone but Tom and Mammy. "'Here, Uncle Tom,' said Eva, "'is a beautiful one for you. Oh, I am so happy, Uncle Tom, to think I shall see you in heaven, for I am sure I shall. And Mammy, dear, good, kind Mammy, she said fondly, throwing her arms around her old nurse, I know you'll be there, too. Oh, Miss Eva, don't see how I can live without you know how, said the faithful creature. Pears like it's just taking everything off the place to once it's— And Mammy gave way to a passion of grief. Miss Ophelia pushed her and Tom gently from the apartment, and thought they were all gone. But as she turned, Topsy was standing there. "'Where did you start up from?' she said suddenly. "'I was here,' said Topsy, wiping the tears from her eyes. "'Oh, Miss Eva, I've been a bad girl. But won't you give me one, too?' "'Yes, poor Topsy, to be sure I will. There, every time you look at that, think that I love you, and wanted you to be a good girl.' "'Oh, Miss Eva, I is trying,' said Topsy earnestly. "'But, Lord, it's so hard to be good. Pears like I ain't used to it no ways. Jesus knows it, Topsy. He is sorry for you. He will help you.' Topsy, with her eyes hid in her apron, was silently passed from the apartment by Miss Ophelia. But as she went, she hid the precious curl in her bosom. All being gone, Miss Ophelia shut the door. That worthy lady had wiped away many tears of her own during the scene, but concern for the consequence of such an excitement to her young charge was uppermost in her mind. St. Clair had been sitting during the whole time, with his hand shading his eyes, in the same attitude. When they were all gone, he sat so still. "'Papa,' said Eva, gently, laying her hand on his. He gave a sudden start and shiver, but made no answer. "'Dear Papa,' said Eva. I cannot, said St. Clair, rising. I cannot have it so. The Almighty hath dealt very bitterly with me. And St. Clair pronounced these words with a bitter emphasis, indeed. Augustine, has not God a right to do what he will with his own? said Miss Ophelia. Perhaps so, but that doesn't make it any easier to bear, said he, with a dry, hard, tearless manner, as he turned away. Papa, you break my heart said Eva, rising and throwing herself into his arms. "'You must not feel so.' The child sobbed and wept with a violence which alarmed them all, and turned her father's thoughts at once to another channel. "'There, Eva, there, dearest. Hush, hush, I was wrong. I was wicked. I will feel any way, do any way. Only don't distress yourself. Don't sob so. I will be resigned. I was wicked to speak as I did.' Eva soon lay like a weary dove in her father's arms, and he, bending over her, soothed her by every tender word he could think of. Marie rose and threw herself out of the apartment into her own, when she fell into violent hysterics. "'You didn't give me a curl, Eva,' said her father, smiling sadly. "'They are all yours, Papa,' said she, smiling. "'Yours and Mamma's, and you must give her dear Auntie as many as she wants. I only gave them to our poor people myself, because, you know, Papa, they might be forgotten when I am gone, and because I hoped it might help them remember. You are a Christian, are you not, Papa?" said Eva doubtfully. 
Why do you ask me? I don't know. You are so good, I don't see how you can help it. What is being a Christian, Eva? Loving Christ most of all, said Eva. Do you, Eva? Certainly I do. You never saw him, said St. Clair. That makes no difference, said Eva. I believe him, and in a few days I shall see him. And the young face grew fervent, radiant with joy. St. Clair said no more. It was a feeling which he had seen before in his mother, but no chord within vibrated to it. Eva, after this, declined rapidly. There was no more any doubt of the event. The fondest hope could not be blinded. Her beautiful room was avowedly a sick-room, and Miss Ophelia day and night performed the duties of a nurse, and never did her friends appreciate her value more than in that capacity. With so well-trained a hand and eye, such perfect adroitness and practice in every art which could promote neatness and comfort, and keep out of sight every disagreeable incident of sickness, with such a perfect sense of time, such a clear, untroubled head, such exact accuracy in remembering every prescription and direction of the doctors, she was everything to him. They who had shrugged their shoulders at her little peculiarities and setnesses, so unlike the careless freedom of southern manners, acknowledged that now she was the exact person that was wanted. Uncle Tom was much in Eva's room, the child suffered much from nervous restlessness, and it was a relief to her to be carried and it was Tom's greatest delight to carry her little frail form in his arms, resting on a pillow, now up and down her room, now out into the veranda, and when the fresh sea-breezes blew from the lake, and the child felt freshest in the morning, he would sometimes walk with her under the orange-trees in the garden, or, sitting down in some of their old seats, sing to her their favorite old hymns. Her father often did the same thing, but his frame was slighter, and when he was weary, Eva would say to him, "'Oh, Papa, let Tom take me. Poor fellow, it pleases him, and you know it's all he can do now, and he wants to do something.' "'So do I, Eva,' said her father. "'Well, Papa, you can do everything, and are everything to me. You read to me, you sit up nights, and Tom has only this one thing and his singing. And I know, too, he does it easier than you can. He carries me so strong.' The desire to do something was not confined to Tom. Every servant in the establishment showed the same feeling, and in their way did what they could. Poor Mammy's heart yearned toward her darling, but she found no opportunity night or day, as Marie declared that the state of her mind was such it was impossible for her to rest. And, of course, it was against her principles to let any one else rest. Twenty times in a night Mammy would be roused to rub her feet, to bathe her head, to find her pocket-handkerchief, to see what the noise was in Eva's room, to let down a curtain because it was too light, or to put it up because it was too dark. And in the daytime, when she longed to have some share in the nursing of her pet, Marie seemed unusually ingenuous in keeping her busy anywhere and everywhere all over the house, or about her own person, so that stolen interviews and momentary glimpses were all she could obtain. I feel it is my duty to be particularly careful of myself now," she would say, feeble as I am, and with the whole care and nursing of that dear child upon me. "'Indeed, my dear,' said St. Clair, "'I thought our cousin relieved you of that. You talk like a man, St. Clair, just as if a mother could be relieved of the care of a child in that state. But then it's all alike. No one ever knows what I feel. I can't throw things off as you do.' St. Clair smiled. You must excuse him, he couldn't help it, for St. Clair could smile yet. For so bright and placid was the farewell voyage of the little spirit. By such sweet and fragrant breezes was the small bark borne toward the heavenly shores, that it was impossible to realize that it was death that was approaching. The child felt no pain, only a tranquil soft weakness, daily and almost insensibly increasing. And she was so beautiful, so loving, so trustful, so happy that one could not resist the soothing influence of that air of innocence and peace which seemed to breathe around her. St. Clair found a strange calm coming over him. It was not hope. That was impossible. It was not resignation. It was only a calm resting in the present, which seemed so beautiful that he wished to think of no future. It was like that hush of spirit which we feel amid the bright, mild woods of autumn, 
when the bright hectic flush is on the trees, and the last lingering flowers by the brook, and we joy in it all the more, because we know that soon it will all pass away. The friend who knew most of Eva's own imaginings and foreshadowings was her faithful bearer, Tom. To him she said what she would not disturb her father by saying. To him she imparted those mysterious intimations which the soul feels, as the cords begin to unbind, ere it leaves its clay for ever. Tom, at last, would not sleep in his room, but lay all night in the outer veranda, ready to rouse at every call. "'Uncle Tom, what alive have you taken to sleeping anywhere and everywhere like a dog for?' said Miss Ophelia. "'I thought you was one of the orderly sort that liked to lie in bed in a Christian way.' "'I do, Miss Feely,' said Tom mysteriously. "'I do. But now—' "'Well, what now?' "'We mustn't speak loud. Master St. Clair won't hear on. But, Miss Feely, you know there must be somebody watching for the bridegroom.' "'What do you mean, Tom?' You know it says in the scripture, At midnight there was a great cry made. Behold, the bridegroom cometh. That's what I'm expecting now every night, Miss Phoebe, and I couldn't sleep out of hearing no ways. Well, Uncle Tom, what makes you think so? Miss Eva, she talks to me. The Lord, he sends his messenger in the soul. I must be thar, Miss Phoebe. For when that our blessed child goes into the kingdom, They'll open the door so wide we'll all get a look in at the glory, Miss Feely. Uncle Tom, did Miss Eva say she felt more unwell than usual tonight? No, but she told me this morning she was coming nearer. There's them that tells it to the child, Miss Feely. It's the angels. It's the trumpet sound afore the break of day, said Tom, quoting from a favorite hymn. This dialogue passed between Miss Ophelia and Tom between ten and eleven one evening, after her arrangements had all been made for the night, when, on going to bolt her outer door, she found Tom stretched along by it in the outer veranda. She was not nervous or impressible, but the solemn, heartfelt manner struck her. Eva had been unusually bright and cheerful that afternoon, and had sat raised in her bed, and looked over all her little trinkets and precious things, and designated the friends to whom she would have them given, and her manner was more animated, and her voice more natural, than they had known it for weeks. Her father had been in, in the evening, and had said that Eva appeared more like her former self than ever she had done since her sickness. And when he kissed her for the night, he said to Miss Ophelia, "'Cousin, we may keep her with us after all. She is certainly better.' And he had retired with a lighter heart in his bosom than he had had there for weeks. But at midnight, strange mystic hour, when the veil between the frail present and the eternal future grows thin, then came the messenger. There was a sound in that chamber, first of one who stepped quickly. It was Miss Ophelia, who had resolved to sit up all night with her little charge, and who, at the turn of the night, had discerned what experienced nurses significantly call a change. The outer door was quickly opened, and Tom, who was watching outside, was on the alert in a moment. "'Go for the doctor, Tom. Lose not a moment,' said Miss Ophelia, and stepping across the room she rapped at St. Clair's door. "'Cousin,' she said, "'I wish you would come.' Those words fell on his heart like clods upon a coffin. Why did they? He was up and in the room in an instant, and bending over Eva, who still slept. What was it he saw that made his heart stand still? Why was no word spoken between the two? Thou canst stay, who hast seen that same expression on the face dearest to thee, that look indescribable hopeless, unmistakable, that says to thee that thy beloved is no longer thine. On the face of the child, however, there was no ghastly imprint, only a high and almost sublime expression, the overshadowing presence of spiritual natures, the dawning of immortal life in that childish soul. They stood there so still, gazing upon her, that even the ticking of the watch seemed too loud. In a few moments Tom returned with the doctor. He entered, gave one look, and stood silent as the rest. "'When did this change take place?' said he in a low whisper to Miss Ophelia. "'About the turn of the night,' was the reply. Marie, roused by the entrance of the doctor, appeared hurriedly from the next room. "'Augustine? Cousin? Oh! What?' she hurriedly began. "'Hush!' said St. Clair hoarsely. "'She is dying.' Mammy heard the words, and flew to awaken the servants. The house was soon roused. Lights were seen. 
footsteps heard, anxious faces thronged the veranda, and looked tearfully through the glass doors. But St. Clair heard and said nothing. He saw only that look on the face of the little sleeper. "'Oh, if she would only wake and speak once more,' he said, and stooping over her he spoke in her ear. "'Eva, darling!' The large blue eyes unclosed. A smile passed over her face. She tried to raise her head and to speak. "'Do you know me, Eva?' "'Dear Papa!' said the child, with a last effort throwing her arms about his neck. In a moment they dropped again, and as St. Clair raised his head, he saw a spasm of mortal agony pass over the face. She struggled for breath, and threw up her little hands. "'Oh, God, this is dreadful!' he said, turning away in agony, and wringing Tom's hand, scarce conscious of what he was doing. "'Oh, Tom, my boy, it is killing me!' Tom had his master's hands between his own, and with tears streaming down his dark cheeks, looked up for help where he had always been used to look. "'Pray that this may be cut short,' said St. Clair. "'This wrings my heart.' "'Oh, bless the Lord! It's over! It's over, dear master!' said Tom. "'Look at her!' The child lay panting on her pillows, as one exhausted. The large, clear eyes rolled up and fixed. Ah, what said those eyes that spoke so much of heaven? Earth was past, and earthly pain. But so solemn, so mysterious was the triumphant brightness of that face, that it checked even the sobs of sorrow. They pressed around her in breathless stillness. "'Eva!' said St. Clair gently. She did not hear. "'Oh, Eva, tell us what you see. What is it?' said her father. A bright, a glorious smile passed over her face, and she said brokenly, "'Oh, love, joy, peace!' gave one sigh, and passed from death unto life. "'Farewell, beloved child. The bright eternal doors have closed after thee. We shall see thy sweet face no more. Oh, woe for them who watch thy entrance into heaven, when they shall wake, and find only the cold gray sky of daily life, and thou gone for ever. End of chapter 26 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Uncle Tom's Cabin by Harriet Beecher Stowe Chapter 27 This is the last of the earth. Note, this is the last of the earth. I am content. Last words of John Quincy Adams, uttered February 21, 1848. The statuettes and pictures in Eva's room were shrouded in white napkins, and only hushed breathings and muffled footfalls were heard there, and the light stole in solemnly through windows partially darkened by closed blinds. The bed was draped in white, and there beneath the drooping angel figure lay a little sleeping form, sleeping never to awaken. There she lay, robed in one of the simple white dresses she had been wont to wear when living. The rose-colored light through the curtains cast over the icy coldness of death a warm glow. The heavy eyelashes drooped softly on the pure cheek. The head was turned a little to one side, as if in natural sleep. But there was diffused over every lineament of the face that high celestial expression, that mingling of rapture and repose, which showed it was no earthly or temporary sleep, but the long, sacred rest which he giveth to his beloved. There is no death to such as thou, dear Eva, neither darkness nor shadow of death, only such a bright fading as when the morning star fades in the golden dawn. Thine is the victory without the battle, the crown without the conflict. So did St. Clair think, as with folded arms he stood there gazing. Ah, who shall say what he did think? For from the hour that voices had said in the dying chamber, She is gone, it had been all a dreary mist, a heavy dimness of anguish. He had heard voices around him, he had had questions asked, and answered them. They had asked him when he would have the funeral, and where they should lay her, and he had answered impatiently that he cared not. Adolphe and Rosa had arranged the chamber. Volatile, fickle and childish as they generally were, they were soft-hearted and full of feeling. 
and, while Miss Ophelia presided over the general details of order and neatness, it was their hands that added those soft poetic touches to the arrangements that took from the death-room the grim and ghastly air which too often marks a New England funeral. There were still flowers on the shelves, all white, delicate, and fragrant, with graceful drooping leaves. Eva's little table, covered with white, bore on it her favorite vase, with a single white moss rosebud in it. The folds of the drapery, the fall of the curtains, had been arranged and rearranged by Adolphe and Rosa, with that nicety of eye which characterizes their race. Even now, while St. Clair stood there thinking, little Rosa tripped softly into the chamber with a basket of white flowers. She stepped back when she saw St. Clair, and stopped respectfully. But, seeing that he did not observe her, she came forward to place them around the dead. St. Clair saw her as in a dream, while she placed in the small hands a fair cape jessamine, and with admirable taste disposed other flowers around the couch. The door opened again, and Topsy, her eyes swelled with crying, appeared, holding something under her apron. Rosa made a quick forbidding gesture, but she took a step into the room. "'You must go out,' said Rosa, in a sharp positive whisper. "'You haven't any business here.' "'Oh, do let me! I brought a flower! Such a pretty one!' said Topsy, holding up a half-blown tea rosebud. "'Do let me just put one there!' "'Get along,' said Rosa, more decidedly. "'Let her stay,' said St. Clair, suddenly stamping his foot. "'She shall come.' Rosa suddenly retreated, and Topsy came forward and laid her offering at the feet of the corpse. Then, suddenly, with a wild and bitter cry, she threw herself on the floor alongside the bed, and wept, and moaned aloud. Miss Ophelia hastened into the room, and tried to raise and silence her, but in vain. "'Oh, Miss Eva! Oh, Miss Eva! I wish I's dead, too! I do!' There was a piercing wildness in the cry. The blood flushed into St. Clair's white, marble-like face, and the first tears he had shed since Eva died stood in his eyes. "'Get up, child,' said Miss Ophelia, in a softened voice. "'Don't cry so. Miss Eva is gone to heaven. She is an angel.' "'But I can't see her,' said Topsy. "'I never shall see her.' And she sobbed again. They all stood a moment in silence. "'She said she loved me,' said Topsy. "'She did. Oh, dear, oh, dear, there ain't nobody left now, there ain't.' "'That's true enough,' said St. Clair. "'But do—' he said to Miss Ophelia. See if you can't comfort the poor creature. "'I just wish I hadn't never been born,' said Topsy. "'I didn't want to be born, no ways, and I don't see no use on it.' Miss Ophelia raised her gently, but firmly, and took her from the room. But as she did so, some tears fell from her eyes. "'Topsy, you poor child,' she said, as she led her into her room. "'Don't give up. I can love you, though I am not like that dear little child.' I hope I've learned something of the love of Christ from her. I can love you. I do, and I'll try to help you to grow up a good Christian girl." Miss Ophelia's voice was more than her words, and more than that were the honest tears that fell down her face. From that hour she acquired an influence over the mind of the destitute child that she never lost. "'Oh, my Eva, whose little hour on earth did so much of good,' thought St. Clair. What account have I to give for my long years?" There were for a while soft whisperings and footfalls in the chamber, as one after another stole in to look at the dead. And then came the little coffin. And then there was a funeral, and carriages drove to the door, and strangers came and were seated. And there were white scarves and ribbons, and crape bands, and mourners dressed in black crape. And there were words read from the Bible, and prayers offered. And St. Clair lived, and walked, and moved, as one who has shed every tear. To the last he saw only one thing, that golden head in the coffin. But then he saw the cloth spread over it, the lid of the coffin closed, and he walked, when he was put beside the others, down to a little place at the bottom of the garden, and there, by the mossy seat where she and Tom had talked, and sung, and read so often, was the little grave. St. Clair stood beside it, looked vacantly down. He saw them lower the little coffin. He heard dimly the solemn words, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And as the earth was cast in and filled up the little grave, 
he could not realize that it was his Eva that they were hiding from his sight. Nor was it, not Eva, but only the frail seed of that bright immortal form with which she shall yet come forth in the day of the Lord Jesus. And then all were gone, and the mourners went back to the place which should know her no more. And Marie's room was darkened, and she lay on the bed, sobbing and moaning in uncontrollable grief, and calling every moment for the attentions of all her servants. Of course, they had no time to cry. Why should they? The grief was her grief, and she was fully convinced that nobody on earth did, could, or would feel as she did. St. Clair did not shed a tear, she said. He didn't sympathize with her. It was perfectly wonderful to think how hard-hearted and unfeeling he was when he must know how she suffered. So much are people the slave of their eye and ear that many of the servants really thought that Mrs. was the principal sufferer in the case, especially as Marie began to have hysterical spasms, and sent for the doctor, and at last declared herself dying, and, in the running and scampering and bringing up hot bottles and heating of flannels and chafing and fussing that ensued, there was quite a diversion. Tom, however, had a feeling at his own heart that drew him to his master. He followed him wherever he walked, wistfully and sad, and when he saw him sitting so pale and quiet in Eva's room, holding before his eyes her little open Bible, though seeing no letter or word of what was in it, there was more sorrow to Tom in that still, fixed, tearless eye than in all Marie's moans and lamentations. In a few days the St. Clair family were back again in the city. Augustine, with the restlessness of grief, longing for another scene, to change the current of his thoughts. So they left the house and garden, with its little grave, and came back to New Orleans. And St. Clair walked the streets busily, and strove to fill up the chasm in his heart with hurry and bustle, and change of place. And people who saw him in the street, or met him at the café, knew of his loss only by the weed on his hat for there he was, smiling and talking, and reading the newspaper, and speculating on politics, and attending to business matters. And who could see that all this smiling outside was but a hollowed shell over a heart that was a dark and silent sepulchre? "'Mr. St. Clair is a singular man,' said Marie to Miss Ophelia, in a complaining tone. "'I used to think, if there was anything in the world he did love, it was our dear little Eva but he seems to be forgetting her very easily. I cannot ever get him to talk about her. I really did think he would show more feeling." "'Still waters run deepest, they used to tell me,' said Miss Ophelia oracularly. "'Oh, I don't believe in such things. It's all talk. If people have feelings, they will show it. They can't help it. But, then, it's a great misfortune to have feeling. I'd rather have been made like St. Clair. My feelings prey upon me so. "'Sure, Mrs. Master St. Clair is getting thin as a shader. They say he, he don't eat, never eat nothing,' said Mammy. "'I know he don't forget Miss Eva. I know there couldn't nobody.' A "'Dear little blessed critter,' she added, wiping her eyes. "'Well, at all events, he has no consideration for me,' said Marie. "'He hasn't spoken one word of sympathy, and he must know how much more a mother feels than any man can.' "'The heart knoweth its own bitterness.' said Miss Ophelia gravely. "'That's just what I think. I know just what I feel. Nobody else seems to. Eva used to, but she is gone.' And Marie lay back on her lounge, and began to sob disconsolately. Marie was one of those unfortunately constituted mortals, in whose eyes whatever is lost and gone assumes a value which it never had in possession. Whatever she had, she seemed to survey only to pick flaws in it, but, once fairly away, there was no end to her valuation of it. While this conversation was taking place in the parlour, another was going on in St. Clair's library. Tom, who was always uneasily following his master about, had seen him go to his library some hours before, and after vainly waiting for him to come out, determined at last to make an errand in. He entered softly. St. Clair lay on his lounge at the further end of the room. He was lying on his face, with Eva's Bible open before him, at a little distance. Tom walked up, and stood by the sofa. He hesitated, and while he was hesitating, St. Clair suddenly raised himself up. The honest face, so full of grief, and with such an imploring expression of affection and sympathy, struck his master. He laid his hand on Tom's, and bowed down his forehead on it. "'Oh, Tom, my boy!' 
the whole world is as empty as an egg-shell. "'I know it, Massa. I know it,' said Tom. "'But, oh, if Massa could only look up, up where our dear Eva is, up to the dear Lord Jesus!' "'Ah, Tom, I do look up, but the trouble is I don't see anything when I do. I wish I could.' Tom sighed heavily. It seems to be given to children and poor honest fellows like you to see what we can't," said St. Clair. How comes it? Thou has hid from the wise and prudent, and revealed unto babes, murmured Tom. Even so, father, for so it seemed good in thy sight. Tom, I don't believe. I can't believe. I've got the habit of doubting, said St. Clair. I want to believe this Bible, and I can't. Dear Massa, Pray to the good Lord. Lord, I believe. Help thou my unbelief." "'Who knows anything about anything?' said St. Clair, his eyes wandering dreamily and speaking to himself. "'Was all that beautiful love and faith only one of the ever-shifting phases of human feeling, having nothing real to rest on, passing away with a little breath? And is there no more Eva, no heaven, no Christ, nothing? Oh, dear Massa, there is. I know it. I am sure of it," said Tom, falling on his knees. Do, do, dear Massa, believe it. How do you know there is any Christ, Tom? You never saw the Lord. Felt him in my soul, Massa. Feel him now. Oh, Massa, when I was sold away from my old woman and the children, I was just the most broke up. I felt as if there weren't nothing left. And then the good Lord, he stood by me, and he says, Fear not, Tom, and he brings light and joy in the poor feller's soul, makes all peace, and I is so happy, and loves everybody, and feels willin' just to be the Lord's, and have the Lord's will done, and be put just where the Lord wants to put me. I know it couldn't come from me, cause I's a poor complainin' critter. It comes from the Lord, and I know he's willin' to do for Masser. Tom spoke with fast-running tears and choking voice. St. Clair leaned his head on his shoulder, and wrung the hard, faithful black hand. "'Tom, you love me,' he said. "'I is willing to lay down my life this blessed day to see Master a Christian.' "'Poor foolish boy,' said St. Clair, half-raising himself. "'I'm not worth the love of one good, honest heart like yours. "'Oh, Master, there's more than me loves you. The blessed Lord Jesus loves you.' "'How do you know that, Tom?' said St. Clair. Feels it in my soul. Oh, Massa, the love of Christ that passeth knowledge. Singular, said St. Clair, turning away, that the story of a man that lived and died eighteen hundred years ago can affect people so yet. But he was no man, he added suddenly. No man ever had such long and living power. Oh, that I could believe what my mother taught me, and pray as I did when I was a boy. If Massa pleases, said Tom, Miss Eva used to read this so beautifully. I wish Massa'd be so good as read it. Don't get no reading hardly, now Miss Eva's gone." The chapter was the eleventh of John, the touching account of the raising of Lazarus. St. Clair read it aloud, often pausing to wrestle down feelings which were roused by the pathos of the story. Tom knelt before him with clasped hands, and with an absorbed expression of love, trust, adoration on his quiet face. Tom, said his master, this is all real to you. I can just fairly see it, Massa, said Tom. I wish I had your eyes, Tom. I wish to the dear Lord Massa had. But, Tom, you know that I have a great deal more knowledge than you. What if I should tell you that I don't believe this Bible? Oh, Massa, said Tom, holding up his hands with a deprecating gesture. Wouldn't it shake your faith some, Tom?" "'Not a grain," said Tom. "'Why, Tom, you must know I know the most. Oh, Massa, haven't you just read how he hides from the wise and prudent, and reveals unto babes? But Massa wasn't in earnest for certain now," said Tom anxiously. "'No, Tom, I was not. I don't disbelieve, and I think there is reason to believe, and still I don't. It's a troublesome bad habit I've got, Tom. If Massa would only pray! How do you know I don't, Tom? 
does, Massa? I would, Tom, if there was anybody there when I pray, but it's all speaking unto nothing when I do. But come, Tom, you pray now and show me how. Tom's heart was full. He poured it out in prayer, like waters that have been long suppressed. One thing was plain enough. Tom thought there was somebody to hear, whether there were or not. In fact, St. Clair felt himself borne on the tide of his faith and feeling, almost to the gates of that heaven he seemed so vividly to conceive. It seemed to bring him nearer to Eva. "'Thank you, Tom, my boy,' said St. Clair, when Tom rose. "'I like to hear you, Tom. But go now, and leave me alone. Some other time I'll talk more.' Tom silently left the room. End of chapter 27 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Uncle Tom's Cabin by Harriet Beecher Stowe Chapter 28 Reunion Week after week glided away in the St. Clair mansion, and the waves of life settled back to their usual flow, where that little bark had gone down. For how imperiously, how coolly, in disregard of all one's feeling, does the hard, cold, uninteresting course of daily realities move on! Still must we eat and drink, and sleep, and wake again. Still bargain, buy, sell, ask, and answer questions. Pursue, in short, a thousand shadows, though all interest them be over the cold mechanical habit of living remaining after all vital interest in it has fled. All the interests and hopes of St. Clair's life had unconsciously wound themselves around this child. It was for Eva that he had managed his property. It was for Eva that he had planned the disposal of his time. And to do this and that for Eva, to buy, improve, alter, and arrange, or dispose something for her, had been so long his habit that now she was gone, there seemed nothing to be thought of, and nothing to be done. True, there was another life, a life which, once believed in, stands as a solemn, significant figure before the otherwise unmeaning ciphers of time, changing them to orders of mysterious, untold value. St. Clair knew this well, and often, in many a weary hour, he heard that slender, childish voice calling him to the skies and saw that little hand pointing to him the way of life. But a heavy lethargy of sorrow lay on him. He could not arise. He had one of those natures which could better and more clearly conceive of religious things, from its own perceptions and instincts, than many a matter-of-fact and practical Christian. The gift to appreciate and the sense to feel the finer shades and relations of moral things often seems an attribute of those whose whole life shows a careless disregard of them. Hence Moore, Byron, Goethe, often speak words more wisely descriptive of the true religious sentiment than another man, whose whole life is governed by it. In such minds disregard of religion is a more fearful treason, a more deadly sin. St. Clair had never pretended to govern himself by any religious obligation and a certain fineness of nature gave him such an instinctive view of the extent of the requirements of Christianity that he shrank, by anticipation, from what he felt would be the exactions of his own conscience, if he once did resolve to assume them. For so inconsistent is human nature, especially in the ideal, that not to undertake a thing at all seems better than to undertake and come short. Still, St. Clair was, in many respects, another man. He read his little Eva's Bible seriously and honestly. He thought more soberly and practically of his relations to his servants, enough to make him extremely dissatisfied with both his past and present course. And one thing he did, soon after his return to New Orleans, and that was to commence the legal steps necessary to Tom's emancipation which was to be perfected as soon as he could get through the necessary formalities. Meantime he attached himself to Tom more and more every day. In all the wide world there was nothing that seemed to remind him so much of Eva, and he would insist on keeping him constantly about him, and, fastidious and unapproachable as he was with regard to his deeper feelings, he almost thought aloud to Tom. 
nor would any one have wondered at it who had seen the expression of affection and devotion with which Tom continually followed his young master. "'Well, Tom,' said St. Clair, the day after he had commenced the legal formalities for his enfranchisement, "'I'm going to make a free man of you, so have your trunk packed, and get ready to set out for Kentuck.' The sudden light of joy that shone in Tom's face as he raised his hands to heaven, his emphatic, "'Bless the Lord!' rather discomposed St. Clair. He did not like it that Tom should be so ready to leave him. "'You uh, haven't had such very bad times here, that you need be in such a rapture, Tom,' he said dryly. "'No, no, Massa, tain't that. It's being a free man. That's what I'm joined for.' Why, Tom, don't you think, for your own part, you've been better off than to be free? No, indeed, Massa St. Clair, said Tom, with a flash of energy. No, indeed. Why, Tom, you couldn't possibly have earned by your work such clothes and such living as I have given you. Knows all that, Massa St. Clair. Massa's been too good, but, Massa, I'd rather have poor clothes, poor house, poor everything, and have em mine, than have the best and have em any man's else. I had so, Massa. I think it's nature, Massa. I suppose so, Tom. And you'll be going off and leaving me in a month or so," he added rather discontentedly. Though why you shouldn't, no mortal knows, he said in a gayer tone. And getting up, he began to walk the floor. Not while Massa is in trouble, said Tom. I'll stay with Massa as long as he wants me, so as I can be any use. "'Not while I'm in trouble, Tom?' said St. Clair, looking sadly out of the window. "'And when will my trouble be over?' "'When Massa St. Clair's a Christian,' said Tom. "'And you really mean to stay by till that day comes?' said St. Clair, half-smiling, as he turned from the window and laid his hand on Tom's shoulder. "'Ah, Tom, you soft, silly boy! I won't keep you till that day. Go home to your wife and children, and give my love to all.' "'As faith to believe that day will come,' said Tom earnestly, and with tears in his eyes. "'The Lord has work for Massa.' "'A work, hey?' said St. Clair. "'Well, now, Tom, give me your views on what sort of a work it is. Let's hear.' "'Why, even a poor fellow like me has a work from the Lord. And Massa St. Clair, that has a larnin' and riches and friends, how much he might do for the Lord.' "'Tom, you seem to think the Lord needs a great deal done for him,' said St. Clair, smiling. "'We does for the Lord when we does for his critters,' said Tom. "'Good theology, Tom. Better than Dr. B. preaches, I dare swear,' said St. Clair. The conversation was here interrupted by the announcement of some visitors. Marie St. Clair felt the loss of Eva as deeply as she could feel anything, and, as she was a woman that had a great faculty of making everybody unhappy, when she was, her immediate attendants had still stronger reason to regret the loss of their young mistress, whose winning ways and gentle intercessions had so often been a shield to them from the tyrannical and selfish exactions of her mother. Poor old Mammy, in particular, whose heart, severed from all normal domestic ties, had consoled itself with this one beautiful being, was almost heartbroken. She cried day and night and was, from excess of sorrow, less skilful and alert in her ministrations of her mistress than usual, which drew down a constant storm of invectives on her defenceless head. Miss Ophelia felt the loss, but in her good and honest heart it bore fruit unto everlasting life. She was more softened, more gentle, and though equally assiduous in every duty, it was with a chastened and quiet air, as one who communed with her own heart not in vain. She was more diligent in teaching Topsy, taught her mainly from the Bible, did not any longer shrink from her touch, or manifest an ill-repressed disgust, because she felt none. She viewed her now through the softened medium that Eva's hand had first held before her eyes, and saw in her only an immortal creature, whom God had sent to be led by her to glory and virtue. Topsy did not become at once a saint but the life and death of Eva did work a marked change in her. The callous indifference was gone. There was now sensibility, hope, desire, and the striving for good, a strife irregular, interrupted, suspended oft, but yet renewed again. One day, when Topsy had been sent for by Miss Ophelia, she came hastily, thrusting something into her bosom. 
"'What are you doing there, you limb? You've been stealing something, I'll be bound,' said the imperious little Rosa, who had been sent to call her, seizing her at the same time roughly by the arm. "'You go long, Miss Rosa,' said Topsy, pulling from her. "'Tain't none of your business.' "'None of your sass,' said Rosa. "'I saw you hiding something. I know your tricks.' And Rosa seized her arm, and tried to force her hand into her bosom, while Topsy, enraged, kicked and fought valiantly for what she considered her rights. The clamor and confusion of the battle drew Miss Ophelia and St. Clair both to the spot. "'She's been stealing,' said Rosa. "'I hain't neither,' vociferated Topsy, sobbing with passion. "'Give me that, whatever it is,' said Miss Ophelia firmly. Topsy hesitated, but on a second order pulled out of her bosom a little parcel done up in the foot of one of her own old stockings. Miss Ophelia turned it out. There was a small book which had been given to Topsy by Eva, containing a single verse of scripture arranged for every day in the year, and in a paper the curl of hair that she had given her on that memorable day when she had taken her last farewell. St. Clair was a good deal affected at the sight of it. The little book had been rolled in a long strip of black crepe torn from the funeral weeds. "'What did you wrap this round the book for?' said St. Clair, holding up the crepe. "'Cause, cause, cause t'was Miss Eva. Oh, don't take him away, please,' she said, and, sitting flat down on the floor, and putting her apron over her head, she began to sob vehemently. It was a curious mixture of the pathetic and the ludicrous. The little old stockings, black crape, textbook, fair, soft curl, and Topsy's utter distress. St. Clair smiled, but there were tears in his eyes as he said, "'Come, come, don't cry. You shall have them.' And putting them together, he threw them into her lap, and drew Miss Ophelia with him into the parlor. "'I really think you can make something of that concern,' he said, pointing with his thumb backward over his shoulder. Any mind that is capable of a real sorrow is capable of good. You must try and do something with her." "'The child has improved greatly,' said Miss Ophelia. "'I have great hopes of her. But, Augustine,' she said, laying her hand on his arm, "'one thing I want to ask. Whose is this child to be? Yours or mine?' "'Why, I gave her to you,' said Augustine. "'But not legally. I want her to be mine legally,' said Miss Ophelia. "'Phew, cousin,' said Augustine, "'what will the Abolition Society think? They'll have a day of fasting appointed for this backsliding, if you become a slaveholder. Oh, nonsense! I want her mine, that I may have a right to take her to the free states, and give her her liberty, that all I am trying to do be not undone. Oh, cousin, what an awful doing evil that good may come! I can't encourage it. I don't want you to joke, but to reason," said Miss Ophelia. There is no use in my trying to make this child a Christian child, unless I save her from all the chances and reverses of slavery. And, if you really are willing I should have her, I want you to give me a deed of gift, or some legal paper." "'Well, well,' said St. Clair, "'I will,' and he sat down and unfolded a newspaper to read. "'But I want it done now,' said Miss Ophelia. "'What's your hurry?' "'Because now is the only time there ever is to do a thing in,' said Miss Ophelia. Come, now, here's paper, pen, and ink. Just write a paper." St. Clair, like most men of his class of mind, cordially hated the present tense of action generally, and therefore he was considerably annoyed by Miss Ophelia's downrightedness. "'Why, what's the matter?' said he. "'Can't you take my word? One would think you had taken lessons of the Jews, coming at a fellow so.' "'I want to make sure of it,' said Miss Ophelia. "'You may die, or fail, and then Topsy be hustled off to auction spite of all I can do. Really, you are quite provident. Well, seeing I'm in the hands of a Yankee, there is nothing for it but to concede. And St. Clair rapidly wrote off a deed of gift, which, as he was well versed in the forms of law, he could easily do, and signed his name to it in sprawling capitals, concluding by a tremendous flourish. There! Isn't that black and white now, Miss Vermont? he said, as he handed it to her. "'Good boy,' said Miss Ophelia, smiling. "'But must it not be witnessed?' "'No bother, yes. Here,' he said, opening the door into Marie's apartment. "'Marie, cousin wants your autograph. Just put your name down here.' "'What's this?' said Marie, as she ran over the paper. "'Ridiculous! 
I thought cousin was too pious for such horrid things," she added, as she carelessly wrote her name. But if she has a fancy for that article, I am sure she's welcome. There, now she's yours, body and soul," said St. Clair, handing the paper. No more mine now than she was before," said Miss Ophelia. Nobody but God has a right to give her to me, but I can protect her now. Well, she's yours by a fiction of law, then," said St. Clair, as he turned back into the parlor and sat down to his paper. Miss Ophelia, who seldom sat much in Marie's company, followed him into the parlor, having first carefully laid away the paper. Augustine, she said suddenly, as she sat knitting, have you ever made any provision for your servants in case of your death? No, said St. Clair, as he read on. Then all your indulgence to them may prove a great cruelty by and by." St. Clair had often thought the same thing himself, but he answered negligently, "'Well, I mean to make a provision by and by.' "'When?' said Miss Ophelia. "'Oh, one of these days.' "'What if you should die first? Cousin, what's the matter?' said St. Clair, laying down his paper and looking at her. "'Do you think I show symptoms of yellow fever or cholera? that you are making post-mortem arrangements with such zeal?" "'In the midst of life we are in death,' said Miss Ophelia. St. Clair rose up, and, laying the paper down carelessly, walked to the door that stood open on the veranda, to put an end to a conversation that was not agreeable to him. Mechanically he repeated the last word again, "'Death!' And as he leaned against the railings, and watched the sparkling water as it rose and fell in the fountain, and, as in a dim and dizzy haze, saw flowers and trees and vases of the courts, he repeated, again, the mystic word so common in every mouth, yet of such fearful power, DEATH. Strange that there should be such a word, he said, and such a thing, and we ever forget it, that one should be living, warm and beautiful, full of hopes desires and wants one day, and the next be gone, utterly gone, and for ever. It was a warm and golden evening, and as he walked to the other end of the veranda he saw Tom busily intent on his Bible, pointing as he did so with his finger to each successive word, and whispering them to himself with an earnest air. "'Want me to read to you, Tom,' said St. Clair, seating himself carelessly by him. "'If Massa pleases,' said Tom gratefully. Massa makes it so much plainer." St. Clair took the book and glanced at the place, and began reading one of the passages which Tom had designated by the heavy marks around it. It ran as follows. "'When the Son of Man shall come in His glory, and all His holy angels with Him, then shall He sit upon the throne of His glory. And before Him shall be gathered all nations, and He shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. St. Clair read on, in an animated voice, till he came to the last of the verses. Then shall the king say unto him on his left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire. For I was an hungered, and ye gave me no meat. I was thirsty, and ye gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and ye took me not in. Naked, and ye clothed me not. I was sick, and in prison, and ye visited me not. Then shall they answer unto him, Lord, when saw we thee an hungered, or a thirst, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not minister unto thee? Then shall he say unto them, Inasmuch as ye did it not to one of the least of these my brethren, ye did it not to me. St. Clair seemed struck with this last passage, for he read it twice, the second time, slowly, and as if he were revolving the words in his mind. Tom, he said, these folks that get such hard measure seem to have been doing just what I have, living good, easy, respectable lives, and not troubling themselves to inquire how many of their brethren were hungry, or athirst, or sick, or in prison." Tom did not answer. St. Clair rose up and walked thoughtfully up and down the veranda, seeming to forget everything in his own thoughts. So absorbed was he, that Tom had to remind him twice that the tea-bell had rung, before he could get his attention. St. Clair was absent and thoughtful all tea-time. After tea, he and Marie and Miss Ophelia took possession of the parlor almost in silence. Marie disposed herself on a lounge, under a silken mosquito-curtain, and was soon sound asleep. Miss Ophelia silently busied herself with her knitting. 
St. Clair sat down to the piano and began playing a soft and melancholy movement with the Aeolian accompaniment. He seemed in a deep reverie, and to be soliloquizing to himself by music. After a little he opened one of the drawers, took out an old music-book whose leaves were yellow with age, and began turning it over. There, he said to Miss Ophelia, this was one of my mother's books, and here is her handwriting. Come and look at it. She copied and arranged this Mozart's Requiem. Miss Ophelia came accordingly. It was something she used to sing often, said St. Clair. I think I can hear her now. He struck a few majestic chords and began singing that grand old Latin piece, the Dies Irae. Tom, who was listening in the outer veranda, was drawn by the sound to the very door, where he stood earnestly. He did not understand the words, of course, but the music and manner of singing appeared to affect him strongly, especially when St. Clair sang the more pathetic parts. Tom would have sympathized more heartily if he had known the meaning of the beautiful words. Recordare Jesu pie, quod sum causa tuar viae, ne me perdas ila die. Querens me sedisti lassus, reme misti crucem passus, tantus laor non sit casus. These lines have been thus rather inadequately translated. Think, O Jesus, for what reason thou endurest earth's spite and treason, nor me lose in that dread season. Seeking me, thy womb feet hasted, on the cross thy soul death tasted. Let not all these toils be wasted. Mrs. Stowe's Note St. Clair threw a deep and pathetic expression into the words, for the shadowy veil of years seemed drawn away, and he seemed to hear his mother's voice leading his. Voice and instrument seemed both living, and threw out with vivid sympathy those strange which the ethereal Mozart first conceived as his own dying requiem. When St. Clair had done singing, he sat leaning his head upon his hand a few moments, and then began walking up and down the floor. What a sublime conception is that of a last judgment, said he, a righting of all the wrongs of ages, a solving of all moral problems by an unanswerable wisdom. It is, indeed, a wonderful image. It is a fearful one to us, said Miss Ophelia. It ought to be to me, I suppose, said St. Clair, stopping thoughtfully. I was reading to Tom this afternoon that chapter in Matthew that gives an account of it, and I have been quite struck with it. One should have expected some terrible enormities charged to those who are excluded from heaven, as the reason. But no, they are condemned for not doing positive good, as if that included every possible harm. Perhaps, said Miss Ophelia, it is impossible for a person who does no good not to do harm. And what, said St. Clair, speaking abstractly, but with deep feeling, what shall be said of one whose own heart, whose education, and the wants of society have called in vain to some noble purpose, who has floated on a dreamy neutral spectator of the struggles, agonies, and wrongs of man, when he should have been a worker. I should say, said Miss Ophelia, that he ought to repent, and begin now. Always practical and to the point, said St. Clair, his face breaking out into a smile. You never leave me any time for general reflections, cousin. You always bring me short up against the actual present. You have a kind of eternal now always in your mind. Now is all the time I have anything to do with," said Miss Ophelia. Dear little Eva, poor child," said St. Clair. She had set her little simple soul on a good work for me. It was the first time since Eva's death that he had ever said as many words as these to her, and he spoke now evidently repressing very strong feeling. My view of Christianity is such, he added, that I think no man can consistently profess it without throwing the whole weight of his being against this monstrous system of injustice that lies at the foundation of all our society, and, if need be, sacrificing himself in the battle. That is, I mean that I could not be a Christian otherwise, though I have certainly had intercourse with a great many enlightened and Christian people who did no such thing and I confess that the apathy of religious people on this subject, their want of perception of wrongs that filled me with horror, have engendered in me more skepticism than any other thing. 
"'If you knew all this,' said Miss Ophelia, "'why didn't you do it?' "'Oh, because I have had only that kind of benevolence which consists in lying on a sofa and cursing the church and clergy for not being martyrs and confessors. One can see, you know, very easily how others ought to be martyrs.' "'Well, are you going to do differently now?' said Miss Ophelia. "'God only knows the future,' said St. Clair. "'I am braver than I was, because I have lost all, and he who has nothing to lose can afford all risks. And what are you going to do?' "'My duty, I hope, to the poor and lowly, as fast as I find it out,' said St. Clair, "'beginning with my own servants, for whom I have yet done nothing, and perhaps at some future day it may appear that I can do something for a whole class, something to save my country from the disgrace of that false position in which she now stands before all civilized nations. "'Do you suppose it possible that a nation ever will voluntarily emancipate?' said Miss Ophelia. "'I don't know,' said St. Clair. "'This is a day of great deeds. Heroism and disinterestedness are rising up here and there in the earth. The Hungarian nobles set free millions of serfs at an immense pecuniary loss, and perhaps among us may be found generous spirits who do not estimate honor and justice by dollars and cents. I hardly think so," said Miss Ophelia. But suppose we should rise up tomorrow and emancipate. Who would educate these millions, and teach them how to use their freedom? They never would rise to do much among us. The fact is, we are too lazy and unpractical ourselves ever to give them much of an idea of that industry and energy which is necessary to form them into men. They will have to go north, where labor is the fashion, and universal custom. And tell me now, is there enough Christian philanthropy among your northern states to bear with the process of their education and elevation? You send thousands of dollars to foreign missions, but could you endure to have the heathen sent into your towns and villages, and give your time and thoughts and money to raise them to the Christian standard? That's what I want to know. If we emancipate, are you willing to educate? How many families in your town would take a negro man and woman, teach them, bear with them, and seek to make them Christians? How many merchants would take Adolf if I wanted to make him a clerk, or mechanics if I wanted him taught a trade? If I wanted to put Jane and Rosa to a school, how many schools are there in the northern states that would take them in? How many families that would board them? And yet they are as white as many a woman, north or south. You see, cousin, I want justice done us. We are in a bad position. We are the more obvious oppressors of the negro, but the unchristian prejudice of the north is an oppressor almost equally severe. Well, cousin, I know it is so said Miss Ophelia. I know it was so with me, till I saw that it was my duty to overcome it. But I trust I have overcome it, and I know there are many good people at the North, who in this matter need only to be taught what their duty is to do it. It would certainly be a greater self-denial to receive heathen among us than to send missionaries to them, but I think we should do it." "'You would, I know,' said St. Clair. I'd like to see anything you wouldn't do, if you thought it your duty. "'Well, I'm not uncommonly good,' said Miss Ophelia. "'Others would, if they saw things as I do. I intend to take Topsy home when I go. I suppose our folks will wonder at first, but I think they will be brought to see as I do. Besides, I know there are many people at the North who do exactly what you said.' "'Yes, but they are a minority. And if we should begin to emancipate to any extent, we should soon hear from you.' Miss Ophelia did not reply. There was a pause of some moments and St. Clair's countenance was overcast by a sad, dreamy expression. "'I don't know what makes me think of my mother so much to-night,' he said. "'I have a strange kind of feeling, as if she were near me. I keep thinking of things she used to say. Strange what brings these past things so vividly back to us sometimes.' St. Clair walked up and down the room for some minutes more, and then said, "'I believe I'll go down street a few moments, and hear the news to-night.' He took his hat and passed out. Tom followed him to the passage, out of the court, and asked if he should attend him. "'No, my boy,' said St. Clair. "'I shall be back in an hour.' Tom sat down in the veranda. It was a beautiful moonlight evening, and he sat watching the rising and falling spray of the fountain, 
and listening to its murmur. Tom thought of his home, and that he should soon be a free man, and able to return to it at will. He thought how he should work to buy his wife and boys. He felt the muscles of his brawny arms with a sort of joy as he thought they would soon belong to himself, and how much they could do to work out the freedom of his family. Then he thought of his noble young master, and, ever second to that, came the habitual prayer that he had always offered for him. And then his thoughts passed on to the beautiful Eva, whom he now thought of among the angels, and he thought till he almost fancied that that bright face and golden hair were looking upon him out of the spray of the fountain. And, so musing, he fell asleep, and dreamed he saw her coming bounding towards him, just as she used to come, with a wreath of jessamine in her hair, her cheeks bright, and her eyes radiant with delight. But as he looked, she seemed to rise from the ground, her cheeks wore a paler hue, her eyes had a deep divine radiance, a golden halo seemed round her head, and she vanished from his sight, and Tom was awakened by a loud knocking, and a sound of many voices at the gate. He hastened to undo it, and, with smothered voices and heavy tread, came several men bringing a body wrapped in a cloak and lying on a shutter. The light of the lamp fell full on the face, and Tom gave a wild cry of amazement and despair that rung through all the galleries as the men advanced with their burden to the open parlour door where Miss Ophelia still sat knitting. St. Clair had turned into a café to look over an evening paper. As he was reading, an affray arose between two gentlemen in the room, who were both partially intoxicated. St. Clair and one or two others made an effort to separate them, and St. Clair received a fatal stab in the side with a bowie-knife, which he was attempting to wrest from one of them. The house was full of cries and lamentations, shrieks and screams, servants frantically tearing their hair, throwing themselves on the ground, or running distractedly about, lamenting. Tom and Miss Ophelia alone seemed to have any presence of mind, for Marie was in strong, hysteric convulsions. At Miss Ophelia's direction one of the lounges in the parlour was hastily prepared, and the bleeding form laid upon it. St. Clair had fainted through pain and loss of blood, but as Miss Ophelia applied restoratives, he revived, opened his eyes, looked fixedly on them, looked earnestly around the room, his eyes travelling wistfully over every object, and finally they rested on his mother's picture. The physician now arrived, and made his examination. It was evident, from the expression of his face, that there was no hope. But he applied himself to dressing the wound, and he and Miss Ophelia and Tom proceeded composedly with this work, amid the lamentations and sobs and cries of the affrighted servants, who had clustered about the doors and windows of the veranda. "'Now,' said the physician, "'we must turn all these creatures out. All depends on his being kept quiet.' St. Clair opened his eyes and looked fixedly on the distressed beings whom Miss Ophelia and the doctor were trying to urge from the apartment. "'Poor creatures,' he said, and an expression of bitter self-reproach passed over his face. Adolf absolutely refused to go. Terror had deprived him of all presence of mind. He threw himself along the floor, and nothing could persuade him to rise. The rest yielded to Miss Ophelia's urgent representations that their master's safety depended on their stillness and obedience. St. Clair could say but little. He lay with his eyes shut, but it was evident that he wrestled with bitter thoughts. After a while he laid his hand on Tom's, who was kneeling beside him, and said, "'Tom, poor fellow!' "'What, Massa?' said Tom earnestly. "'I am dying,' said St. Clair, pressing his hand. "'Pray!' "'If you would like a clergyman,' said the physician. St. Clair hastily shook his head, and said again to Tom more earnestly, "'Pray!' and Tom did pray, with all his mind and strength, for the soul that was passing, the soul that seemed looking so steadily and mournfully from those large melancholy blue eyes. It was literally prayer offered with strong crying and tears. When Tom ceased to speak, St. Clair reached out and took his hand, looking earnestly at him, but saying nothing. He closed his eyes, but still retained his hold. For, in the gates of eternity, the black hand and the white hand hold each other with an equal clasp. He murmured softly to himself, at broken intervals, Recordare Jesu pie, ne me perdas illa die, querens me sedisti lasus. 
It was evident that the words he had been singing that evening were passing through his mind, words of entreaty addressed to infinite pity. His lips moved at intervals, as parts of the hymn fell brokenly from them. "'His mind is wandering,' said the doctor. "'No, it is coming home, at last,' said St. Clair energetically. "'At last, at last!' The effort of speaking exhausted him. The sinking paleness of death fell on him. But with it there fell, as if shed from the wings of some pitying spirit, a beautiful expression of peace, like that of a wearied child who sleeps. So he lay for a few moments. They saw that the mighty hand was on him. Just before the spirit parted he opened his eyes, with a sudden light, as of joy and recognition, and said, Mother! And then he was gone. End of chapter 28